Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today we begin a brand new story, a story of baseball and the discovery of a menace that will lead Superman and his friends through many dangerous adventures. Now, the adventures of Superman. It is late afternoon. Superman, in his guise of Clark Kent, the mild-mannered reporter, is in a taxi cab en route to cover an important newspaper story. He is accompanied by cub reporter Jimmy Olsen, who, as manager of the Unity House baseball team, has been given permission to leave the office early in order to attend practice. Listen. We won our last two games while you were out of town, Mr. Kent. Oh, fine. And if we win tomorrow, we'll be in the finals for the boys' championship in Metropolis. Hey, that's great, Jim. Sounds like you're a top-notch manager. Oh, no. Any manager could win with Tommy Lee on his team. Who? Tommy Lee, our pitcher. Boy, he's got everything. Speed, sweet curve, change of pace. He's terrific. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Last time you were telling me about the team, your pitcher was a boy named Riggs, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, Chuck Riggs. That was before Tommy Lee moved into the neighborhood and joined Unity House. Oh? When Tommy showed us how he could throw that old baseball, Chuck had to move over. Oh, it was kind of tough on Chuck, wasn't it? Yeah, I guess so. But if Tommy's a better pitcher, he deserves the job, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, yes, of course. All other things being equal. What do you mean? Well, I mean, baseball is a team game, Jim. To be a good team, all the players must be willing to work together. That's what teamwork means. Oh, Tommy cooperates. He's a swell kid. Everybody likes him. That is, everybody did like him until... Until what? Well, I don't like to say it, but Chuck Riggs is a bit of a sore head. He didn't like getting moved down to number two pitcher, and... Well, he's been trying to turn some of the guys against Tommy. I've had to crack down on him a couple of times. Oh? Oh, but I can handle him, though. Hey, we're coming to the Unity House ball field. Uh, stop at the next corner, please, driver. You're coming to the game tomorrow, aren't you, Mr. Kent? You bet. I'll be there with bells on. Swell. Well, here's where I leave you. Thanks for the ride. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. Good luck. Break it up. Let go, Jim. I'm going to fix this guy. That's what you think. Lay off, Chuck. You too, Tommy. Now, what's this all about? Ah, uh, Tommy was asking for a poke on the nose. You mean you were... Uh, you've been trying to pick a fight with me ever since I got on the team. You're a liar. Don't call me a liar. Cut it out, both of you. Muggs. Yeah, Jim? I thought you were in charge of the team when I wasn't here. Is this the way you run things? Ah, uh, they were belting each other before I could stop them. What were they fighting about? Oh, well, Chuck was riding Tommy all afternoon. I was you not. You be he... quiet, Chuck. Go on, Muggs. Well, when Tommy said Chuck called him a dirty name, and they went at it. What did he call you, Tommy? Oh, what's the difference? I can take care of myself. I didn't call him nothing, that dirty... Skip it. Now, look, Chuck. You've been acting like a sorehead ever since Tommy got to be our number one pitcher. Now, wait a minute. I didn't start this fight. I didn't say you did, but I'm telling you this for the last time. This is a ball club, and everybody on it has got to work together. The guy who won't cooperate gets fired off the team. You get that? What are you picking on me for? Tell her to Tommy. That goes for everybody. There's going to be no more fighting around here. We've got an important game tomorrow, and everybody's got to pull together. You understand? Yeah. Well, okay. Batting practice now, so up to the cage. You pitch, Tommy. Okay, Jim. Come on, everybody hustle. Oh, up on your toes. Let's play ball. Come on, Not till you move back from the plate, Chuck. What do you mean, move back? I'm in the pitching box. You're leaning halfway over the plate. I might hit you with a close one. Ah, you're putting me in the side of a barn. Go on, pitch. Okay, he's asking for it, Tommy. Boy, lift him up. No, I might hit him, Muggs. Move back, Chuck. Go on. I'm standing right here where I'm supposed to. Why don't you admit you're just afraid I'll knock the ball over the fence and make you look bad, you yellow punk? 
why you... Hold it, Tommy. Didn't you hear me say there wasn't going to be any more fighting? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. But look how he's crowding the plate. I don't want to hit him. Get back, Chuck. If you get hit, it's your own fault. Go ahead and pitch, Tommy. Okay, you're the boss, Jim. Come on, quit stalling him. Pitch. Yeah, oh, come, come on. on. Yeah. 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 If you come, put out Chuck. Out of all, Tommy boy. I missed that one by a mile. I was off balance. I won't miss the next one. Go on. Let's show him, Tommy boy. Nice right curve, Tommy. Look, will you please get back from the plate, Chuck? No, I won't. Catch your yellow banana. Cut that out, Chuck. Go ahead, Tommy. Okay. Come on, come on, let's have it. Pitch right to me, Tommy boy. Right down the old eye. This guy can't hit a balloon. If he comes, look, look out, Chuck. Oh, oh hey. gosh. Hey. I beamed him. He didn't step hey. back. He dropped like a log. Come on. <laughs> We'll return in a moment for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. A few minutes ago, Chuck Riggs, deposed pitcher on the Unity House baseball team, was beamed by Tommy Lee while deliberately crowding a plate in batting practice. Jimmy Olsen, Tommy, and Muggs revived the boy with water. Now in the locker room, Chuck is tying his street shoes as Jimmy, Tommy, and Muggs stand by. How does your head feel, Chuck? Uh, okay, I guess. You're lucky I wasn't killed leaning halfway over the plate like a dope. I wasn't leaning over the plate. Yeah, yes, you were, were too. too. I was not. Tommy beat me on purpose. He didn't, and you know it. Of course he knows it. He's just talking like a sawhead. Okay, you guys can stand up for that punk if you want. But wait till you see what happens. What do you mean? What's gonna happen? You'll find out. And so will he. Now look, Chuck. It was an accident. I'm sorry. Let's shake hands. That's the way to talk, Tommy. Go on, Chuck. Shake hands with him. Me shake hands with him? <laughs> Nothing doing. Why have all the swords for two cents? Wait, like... Muggs. Chuck, you were warned to step back, and you didn't. So what happened was your fault. I'll be a nice guy, admit it, and shake hands with Tommy. No, I won't shake hands with him. Okay, then. That makes you a bum loser and a sorehead, and you don't belong on the team. You're fired. Okay, I'm fired. But I'll get you for this, Jim Olsen. And I'll get Tommy, too. You'll see. Furious, Chuck Riggs stalks from the locker room, mounts his bicycle, and rides home. As he dismounts at the small garage behind his house, he is met by his uncle, a tall, powerfully built man who regards him sharply. What's the matter with you, Chuck? Who, me? Oh. Uh, nothing, Uncle Matt. Nothing, uh... And what's that big lump doing on your forehead? Were you fighting? No, sir. Don't lie to me, Chuck. I'm not lying. I... Ah, a kid beamed me with a baseball. Beamed you? Who did it? Oh, ah, just one of the kids on the team. It was an accident, I guess. You guess? Well, I... I guess I was kind of crowding the plate in batting practice. I was pretty sore at this kid, Tommy Lee. Because he beat me out for number one pitcher on the Wait team. Wait a minute. What's the kid's name? Lee. Tommy Lee. He's a pretty good pitcher. And... Did this Lee kid just move into the neighborhood about a month ago? That's right. You know him? Well, if he's the one I think he is, his father just got appointed to the health department as a bacteriologist. I don't know what that is, but the new mayor just did appoint him to the health department. Oh. I heard Tommy telling Jim Olsen and Muggs about it. Yeah, he's the one then. Say, this works out just fine. What does, Uncle Matt? This Lee boy beating you with a baseball gives me just the angle I've been looking for. Now look, Chuck, and listen carefully. Huh? This kid deliberately hit you on the head with a baseball, see? He was trying to kill you. No, no, he wasn't. I told you how it happened. He was trying to kill you, I say. I know this boy, and I know his father. They're bad. But gee whiz, Uncle now, Matt. Now you listen to what I say. They're dangerous, Chuck, these people. Unless we do something about this now, they'll go even further than beating you just the next time. But... Gosh, why? Oh. Tommy already got my position on the team. He don't want nothing else. Now you else. listen to me, Chuck. And remember what I have to say. When Tommy Lee beamed you today, it wasn't any accident. He did it on purpose, do you understand? Well, gee, I didn't think so, but... But maybe... He did it on purpose, I tell you. He was afraid you'd win back your position on the team, so he wanted to get you out of the way. Now you remember that. Okay, Uncle Mac. Yes, now one other thing. There's Jim Olsen you mentioned. Didn't you tell me he was a manager of the Unity House team? Uh-huh. Yeah. He made your second string pitcher and then stood up for Tommy Lee against you. Yeah. He's been on Tommy's side ever since he came out for the team. Okay. We'll take care of him, too. Take care of him? 
What do you mean, Uncle Matt? Now, don't ask questions, Chuck. Go in and eat your supper. And you and I are going someplace. Yeah? Where? To a place where no boy has ever been before. A meeting of real Americans who know how to take care of these Tommy Lees and others like them. Now, go ahead and eat your supper. And look, don't say anything to your mother. Because this is going to be a secret meeting. Now, hurry. We've got important work to do tonight. <laughs> Strangely uneasy, Chuck Riggs looks up at the tall, powerful figure of his uncle, whose eyes blaze with an evil fire the boy has never noticed in them before. What is the secret meeting to which Matt Riggs is taking the boy? What is behind his insistence that Tommy Lee had purposely been Chuck? Evil, subversive forces are set to work against Jim Olsen and Tommy Lee tomorrow. So don't miss the next episode in our thrilling new story, fellows and girls. Tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, the accident on the Unity House baseball field has far-reaching consequences as Chuck Riggs, under instructions from his uncle, attends a strange and secret meeting. And now, the adventures of Superman. Bad feeling between two boys on the Unity House baseball team has resulted in a threat of serious trouble for manager Jimmy Olsen and young Tommy Lee. Jealous because Tommy had supplanted him as number one pitcher, a boy named Chuck Riggs heckled him in batting practice and, when crowding the plate, was accidentally struck in the head. That evening, Chuck told his Uncle Matt what had happened and was surprised to hear his uncle insist that Tommy had beamed him deliberately. Playing on the boy's bitterness, Matt Riggs coached him in what he was to say at a certain secret meeting that night. And as we continue now, Matt is driving his nephew high into the dark, wooded hills above Metropolis. Listen. Look, where are we going, Uncle Matt? I told you, to a secret meeting. What kind of a meeting? You'll find out when we get there. But remember, you're not to breathe a word of what you see or hear to anyone. Not to anyone, do you understand? Yeah, sure, but, but what's wrong All right, now, don't ask any more questions. This is important to me, so remember, Chuck. That boy, Tommy Lee, deliberately beamed you today. He wanted to kill you. Gee, I don't know, Uncle Matt. It might have been an accident. You know, I was crowding the plate. Would you get that stuff out of your head? It wasn't an accident. He did it on purpose. He was afraid you'd win back your position on the team, so he wanted to get you out of the way, don't you see? I really think he did. Huh? I know he did. I remember what I told you. Answer all my questions correctly, and we'll fix him plenty good. <laughs> Carefully drilling his nephew to make him believe the false version of the baseball accident, Matt Riggs drives to the top of a hill, then turns down a rutted, weed-grown road which winds between the trees. Suddenly, they come into an opening, and as the car stops, Chuck gasps at the strange scene before him. In a glade, casting weird shadows over the nearby hills and lighting the sky above, burns a huge wooden cross. Before it kneel half a hundred men clothed in long robes. Pointed hoods, slit only at the eyes, cover their heads and faces and a low guttural chant issues harshly from their hidden lips, sending an uneasy chill through Chuck's blood. While the boy looks about him at the fearsome sight, Matt Riggs dons a robe and hood on which a pale blue scorpion is embroidered. Then, followed by Chuck, he approaches the kneeling hooded band, a strangely barbaric company in the dancing light of the flaming cross. Gosh, who are all these guys, Uncle Matt? And why are you wearing the sheets and hoods? We're the clan of the fiery cross. Plan of the Fiery Cross. Right. We're a great secret society pledged to purify America. America for 100% Americans only. One race, one religion, one color. I don't get it. America's got all kinds of religions and colors. Mm, when we get through, there'll only be one. Only one? But the Constitution says all Americans have the same rights and privileges. Constitution. <laughs> we'll change that. I'll be quiet. Be quiet until I call on you. Attention, brothers. All hail the Trans Scorpion! Brothers, in the clan of the Fiery Cross, 
Supreme authority vested by me as Grand Scorpion, I hereby call this secret session open. Arise now and by the light of the flaming symbol of our creed, make the sign of fealty to our sacred vow. Rising to their feet, the robed and hooded figures solemnly place their right hands over their hearts, and crossing the first two fingers of their left hands, extend them toward the burning wooden cross. As under their breaths, they repeat the anti-democratic oath of the clan. Brothers, as your leader, I felt it my duty to call this special secret meeting tonight because of something of terrific importance to all of us that took place today. Something proving that our sworn enemies have risen against us. That they have already struck the first blow and are preparing to strike more blows at real Americans through our children. Here beside me stands a fatherless American boy who is today the first victim of our sworn enemies. Today an attempt was made by Furman, filthy scum, who have moved into our community on the life of this American boy. Who is it? Who is it? Let's hear it. Now wait, brothers, wait and listen. I want you to hear this terrible story from this unfortunate young victim's own lips. Okay, check. Now you tell him the story, and tell it just the way I told you to. Make no mistakes, you understand? Well, I used to be the pitcher on the Unity House baseball team, and I... I was fired from that position when a new guy joined up. Yeah. And tell us about this boy, Chuck. Is he like us Americans? Uh, no, sir. Could he ever be like us Americans? No, sir. Are his family Americans? Well, they're citizens, but... Yeah, answer the question. Are they good 100% Americans? Uh, no, sir. No. Now go on with your story. What happened today? Well, we had team practice today, and I was up at bat. This... This kid was pitching, and he deliberately threw a fast ball and beamed me. Tell us how you know this attempt to kill you with a pitch ball was deliberate, Chuck. Well, he he said he'd get me because because he wanted to make sure he'd keep the pitching spot. And, and what else? And because when he won the boys' league championship game, why, why it'd give his kind of people a, a sort of weapon to use against American folks like us. Good, good, good work, Chuck. It did swell. Well, did you hear that, brothers in the clan? <laughs> that young whelp who is not a true American, who can never be a true American, tried to kill this fatherless American boy. And why? Because he has been schooled by his kind and their foreign sympathizers to strike against our plan for a pure, clean America, an American free from mixed races, mixed colors, and mixed religion. <laughs> Are we going to stand idly by and see this scum weasel their way into our neighborhoods and our jobs? Oh, Are we going to stand by and watch their striking at our children and yours and yours and mine? Oh, no, indeed, we strike back, and the time is now. So get set for action. The fiery cross burns tonight. <laughs> Heart hammering with fear, Chuck Riggs begins to feel the icy fingers of doubt creeping up his spine as he watches the fanatical fury aroused in the hooded men by his Uncle Matt against what he knows to be a family innocent of offense. But he is powerless to stop the frenzied clan's first act of blood-chilling violence scheduled to take place that night. The following morning, Jim Olson is alone in the Unity House locker room when Tommy Lee enters, his face wan and drawn. Oh, hiya, Tommy. You late for practice. Hurry up and get into your uniform. No, Jim. I'm quitting the team. What? Oh, now, look, Tommy. You can't do this to us. Why, well, we need you. Why, your pitching is the mainstay of the team. We'd fall apart without it's you. It's swell you to say that, but... Oh, I mean it. Gotta have you for today's game. It's the playoff in the semifinals. Well, look, you know I'm not just doing this to let you and the other fellas down. It's just that... Well, I guess I might as well tell you. Last night, a burning cross was planted on our front lawn by a bunch of men wearing hoods and gowns. Well, you know what that means to my family, don't you? Sheepers. That sounds like the Fiery Cross clan. But, but why you and your family? If you don't know, Jim, I can't tell you. I know how I can find out. Look, you go home and sit tight, Tommy. I'm going to see Mr. Ken and tell him about this. And right away. I'll see you later. <laughs> Worried at the thought of losing his star pitcher and puzzled by Tommy's startling story, Jim Olsen rushes off to seek the aid of Clark Kent. 
What is behind this un-American threat to personal freedom and safety? We'll know more in a moment. So stand by for the startling climax of today's episode. Alarmed when his star pitcher, Tommy Lee, told him he must quit the team because of a flaming cross, the terrifying warning symbol of the Fiery Cross clan that was placed on the Lee lawn last night, Jim Olsen rushed to the Daily Planet, where we find him now discussing the outrageous incident with Clark Kent. I didn't know the Fiery Cross clan was even organized in Metropolis, Mr. Kent. Neither did I, Jim. This is very bad news. And how? Another thing that gets me is why they're picking on Tommy Lee and his family. Hmm. Who are the Lees, Jim? Would I know them? I don't know, but I think you'd know about Tommy's father. Huh? He's the man who was just appointed city bacteriologist. Oh, he is, eh? Uh-huh. Do you know him? No, I don't, but I know now at least one reason why they've been singled out by that hooded mob. You do? Mm-hmm. I also know that they're in danger, Jim. Very great danger. Why? What did they do to... Oh, it isn't what they've done, it's what they are. Do you know where they live? Sure. But gee whiz, Mr. Kent, why... Come on. I... I'll answer your questions on the way, Jim. We've got to put a stop to this sort of thing before it goes any further. But before we do anything, we're going to have a talk with Tommy Lee. Let's go. Unaware that he, too, has been marked for the future vengeance of the hooded band by its leader, Matt Riggs, Jim Olsen hurries out after Clark Kent, still puzzled by the reason for the un-American attack on Tommy Lee's family. Why are these people the object of the vicious secret band's fanatical hatred? And what will happen to the Lees and to Jim Olsen if this grim, cowardly warning of intolerance is ignored. Tomorrow's episode is tense and exciting as Superman begins a fight against the most dangerous enemies to personal freedom and democracy in America. Tune in, same time, same station. Don't miss it. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! Kellogg's Pep! P-E-P, Pep! Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman! Today, stunned by the threat against Tommy Lee and his family... Mark Kent and Jimmy Olsen prepare to call at his house, where the symbol of hate had burned an ominous warning. Hello there, gang. This... And now, the adventures of Superman. Jealous because Jimmy Olsen, manager of the Unity House baseball team, had selected young Tommy Lee, a newcomer, as number one pitcher... A boy named Chuck Riggs tried to rattle Tommy by deliberately crowding the plate in batting practice and was accidentally struck in the head. That night, in the glow of a burning cross at a secret meeting in the hills above Metropolis, a band of robed and hooded men heard Chuck and his uncle Matt, their leader, state that Tommy Lee had tried to murder Chuck. Matt Riggs called for immediate action against Tommy and his family, whom he denounced as un-American. An hour later, a cross of fire, symbol of the hooded mob, was burned on the lawn of the Lee home. The next morning, Tommy resigned from the Unity House team. Shocked, Jimmy hurried to the Daily Planet, where he told the story to Clark Kent, who, as we know, is Superman. Listen. What I can't understand, Mr. Kent, is why the Fiery Cross clan should burn a cross in front of Tommy Lee's house. Why, well, they're nice people. Dr. Lee, Tommy's father, is a well-known bacteriologist. Bacteriologist? Uh-huh. You mean Dr. Juan Lee? That's right. Mayor Marshall just appointed him to the health department. Why would they want to bother a man like that? Because the clan of the Fiery Cross is made up of intolerant bigots, Jim. They don't judge a man in the decent American way by his own qualities. They judge him by what church he goes to and by the color of his skin. By the... Jeepers. You mean... Yes, this bigoted mob is against Tommy Lee and his family because they're Chinese. Gosh. I thought we were all through with this kind of stuff when we cleaned up on that rat Frank Hill and his Guardians of America. Oh, intolerance is a filthy weed, Jim. I told you before, the only way you can get rid of it is by hunting out the roots and pulling them out of the ground. Now, come on, we've got to move fast. Where are we going? To see the Lees. We've got to get them to help us get rid of that clan. Hey, what goes on here, Tommy? Why all the packing? We're moving, Jim. Moving where? Out of town. Out of town? 
Holy smoke. I was afraid of something like this, Tommy. Uh, Jim forgot to introduce us. I'm Clark Kent. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Kent. I'm glad to know you. Is your father here? Well, he went out to help Mom. Oh, here he comes. Dad, you know Jim Olsen. Oh, glad to see you again, Jim. Thanks. And this is Clark Kent. He's a reporter on the Daily Planet. Friend of Jim. How do you do? How do you do, Dr. Won't you sit down? We're rather torn up at the moment, but there is one comfortable chair. Uh, Tommy... Uh, Tommy, bring our guests some refreshment. Oh, no, no, thanks. Please, don't bother. Look, Dr. Lee. Yes? I hope you won't mind my asking, but isn't this decision to move rather sudden? Um, yes, it is. I'll bet it's because of that burning cross on your lawn last night. Is it, Doctor? Yes. Well, may I suggest that you're making a mistake? Running away isn't the answer, you know. Do you know who burned the cross on my lawn, Mr. Kent? Oh, the fiery cross bunch, of course, but... Well, I... I have seen them do their dirty work in other parts of the country. And I know that hooded mob of fanatics will stop at nothing when their hate and greed is aroused. Not even murder. Jeepers. I have a wife and a daughter younger than Tommy, Mr. Kent. Would you have me leave them exposed to danger? No, of course not. But I think you'll endanger them more by knuckling under to that hate mob. Look, Dr. Lee, they figure the more people they can frighten, the stronger they become and the harder it is to stamp them out. That's right. And unless we do stamp them out, No place in the country will be safe for you or for any other Americans who happen to be of a different race or color or who practice a different religion. That's right, Dr. Lee. You've got to stand up and fight them. I would stand up and fight them, Jim, if only my own life were at stake. But I have a family. I must think of their safety. You're absolutely right, sir. But the police will protect your family. I'll see Inspector Henderson. I cannot depend on the police. These fanatical bigots are cowards who masquerade as law-abiding citizens by day But when it becomes dark and they can't be seen, they put on their sheets and hoods and become wolves. For all I know, or the police either, my next-door neighbor, who always greets me so pleasantly, may be one of them. Yes, that's all very true, but look, Dr. I hate to leave Metropolis, Dad. I like my school, and and I'm the pitcher on the Unity House team, and, and all. I know, Tommy. I hate to leave, too. I have the position I dreamed of all my life. And now I must give that up and start all over. But it cannot be helped. I tell you, it can be helped, Doctor. If only you'll cooperate with those who want to help you. How do you mean, Mr. Kent? Look, most Americans realize the danger of allowing intolerance to breed. Now, we saw what happened to, to Germany and Italy and other European countries when a, a gang of murdering bigots like the Fiery Cross mob got in power. Now, that's why I suggest you stay here, Dr. Lee. Keep your job and, and let Tommy pitch for his team. That way, we'll be able to flush these hooded cowards out from behind their sheets, and then we can clap them in jail. Hey, that sounds good to me. Let's, Dad. But, Tommy, if something happened to you and your sister and your mother, Look, I'll would... guarantee to have a special police officer assigned to guard this house. Oh, believe me, Doctor, you'll be safer here than running away. Because unless we stop this fiery cross clan now, they'll get you no matter where you go. Perhaps you're right, Mr. King. Oh, you mean you'll stay then, Dr. Lee? Will you, Dad? Yes, Tommy. We will stay. Fine. Oh, boy, that's swell. And how? Get set to pitch for us this afternoon, Tommy. Come on, it's after 12 and the game starts at 2.30. Well, I'm all ready, Jim. Are you coming, Mr. Kent? Oh, I'll be along later. I want to call Inspector Henderson first. How about you, Dad? Are you coming to the game? Yes, son. I will be there. Oh, swell. Come on, Tommy. Okay. So long. See you later. Yeah, so long. Goodbye, boys. Good luck in the game, fellas. Thank you. Now, may I use your telephone, Dr. Lee? I want to call Inspector Henderson and arrange police protection for you. By all means, Mr. Kent, help yourself. Thank you. Uh, If you will excuse me a moment, I will go tell Mrs. Lee to stop packing. Certainly, go right ahead. Well, guarding the Lees from harm is going to be a real job for Superman, I'm afraid. Those hooded gangsters won't stop it. Great Scott! Jim! Tommy, look out! You'll be killed! Galvanized into instant action by a danger to Jim Olsen and Tommy Lee, visible only to his X-ray vision, Clark Kent leaps six feet through the air and, like a thunderbolt, crashes through the window without even taking time to strip off his disguise. What is happening? We'll know in a moment. So stand by for the thrilling climax of today's episode. Clark Kent was dialing police headquarters in Dr. Lee's home. He suddenly shouted a warning, then hurled himself through the window and out to the sidewalk, where Jimmy Olsen and young Tommy Lee were about to mount Tommy's bicycle and ride to Unity House ball field. Now Kent rushes toward them. Off that wheel, boys, fast! Hey, what's the idea, Mr. Kent? Look out! I'm going to wheel it away from the house. 
There it goes. Now look, Mr. Kent. Stand back, Tommy. She was one. Jeepers. Look at that. Why, the bike exploded. Good heavens, what happened, Tommy? There was a small bomb under the seat of Tommy's bicycle, Dr. Lee. Oh, a bomb? Yes, it was set so that if the boys had ridden off the curb to the street as they were starting to, that bomb would have gone off. Holy mackerel. But, but who put it there? Your guess is as good as mine, Doctor. But my hunch says that our friends in the robes and hoods wanted to make sure you'd understand their warning to get out. Yeah. Also, make sure Tommy couldn't pitch today's game. Why, why, this is an outrage. They might have killed Tommy and Jim. Now I'm determined not to leave Metropolis until every cowardly member of that gang of hooded murderers is behind bars. Well, that's the way to talk, Doctor. A fighting attitude is the best antidote for a poison like the Clan of the Fiery Cross. Wow. Do you realize what almost happened to us, Jim? Yeah. Boy, was that a narrow escape. Well, listen, Mr. Kent. Hmm? Well, you were in the house. How could you see the bomb under the seat of the bike? Say, I... that's right. How could you, Mr. Kent? You've got an important game this afternoon, haven't you, Jim? Sure, but first well, I'd like to know... Now, look, here, take this money. Now, I'm buying you fellas a taxi ride to the field. Now, come on, you two, get going. I expect you to win. We'll win, all right. We gotta win now. Come on, Jim. <laughs> Hailing a taxi cab, Jimmy Olsen and Tommy Lee ride to the Unity House baseball field, believing themselves safe. But within five minutes after they arrive, a man steps into a phone booth in a drugstore, carefully closes the door, and dials a number. A moment later, he is answered by Jack Barton, an officer in the clan of the Fiery Cross. Hello? Jack, this is Will. Something went wrong. What do you mean? Tommy Lee just arrived at the field. What? Yeah, and Jim Olsen was with him. Bill must have bungled the job. You stupid fool! Matt Briggs will hit the ceiling. And how? What do we do now? Where are you? In a drugstore across from the field. Call George and Charlie and tell them to get right over. I'll call Matt and tell them to meet us there in five minutes. We can't let that lead kid pitch today. As the cowardly undercover forces of the clan of the Fiery Cross move once more swiftly into action against Tommy Lee, his family, and Jim Olsen, the boys, all unaware of the danger that threatens them, prepare to play off their semifinals championship game. What will happen? What new action is planned by the hooded menace to freedom and democracy in America? Superman has undertaken a job that will tax even his extraordinary powers to the utmost, as we will see in tomorrow's thrill-packed episode. So don't miss it. Tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as the Unity House baseball team warms up for its big game, the clan of the Fiery Cross plans a new attack on Tommy Lee, innocent victim of their hate and bigotry. And now, the adventures of Superman. A young Chinese boy named Tommy Lee, star pitcher on the Unity House baseball team, has been threatened by a group of intolerant bigots who call themselves the clan of the Fiery Cross. And because Jimmy Olsen, who was acting as manager of the team, defended Tommy, he too is marked for danger. Following the burning of a cross on Tommy's lawn and a cowardly attack on Jimmy and Tommy, which was foiled by Superman, the two boys went to Unity House Field, where their team is to play an important game. As we continue now, 20 minutes before game time, an ominous scene is taking place behind the locker room, out of sight of the field. Matt Riggs, Grand Scorpion of the Clan of the Fiery Cross, has been joined by Will Jennings, another hooded mobster. Jennings has a tough-looking boy from the opposing team in tow. Listen. You sure this boy's okay, Will? Yeah, he's Pete Miller's kid. His name is Art. They get that. Just call me something. Yeah, so you're Pete Miller's boy, huh? Well, that's fine. Your father's a very good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, I know. Say, uh... Tell me, how do you feel about this Chinese boy you're playing against today? You mean Tommy Lee? Yeah. Uh, didn't you put up a fight about your team playing with him? Sure I did. I raised heck. 
I tried to get the guys to say they wouldn't play Unity House unless they took that chink off the team. Oh, good boy. Did you know what our coach, the playground director, said? No. What did he say? He said Tommy Lee was an American, the same as the rest of us. And anybody who dis... Well, what do, you, what do you call it? Discriminated against him was a bad American. Oh, he did, eh? what you say to that? Ah, nothing. I had to shut up. Now I'll show everybody what a punk this Tommy Lee is. Wait till I bat against him. Sure, I'm sure. But look, what do you really think about this boy's pitching? Well, I... I, I guess he's pretty good, all right. He shut out South Park last week with only one hit. Well, it looks rather bad for your team, don't you think? You know, it'll make him look good and our kind of people look bad. You wouldn't like that, would you? Ah, uh, what are you building... Maybe he won't beat us today. Well, the chances are he will, unless, uh... Yeah? Unless what? Unless you keep him out of the game. Me? How can I? I told you I tried to. Well, now, let's see. Suppose Tommy was hit in the head or in the arm by your bat. Now, oh, wait a minute. I can't do that. I'll get pinched. Maybe worse. I, I can't... Oh, wait, you little fool. I don't mean for you to walk up to him and brain him. I was talking about an accident. An accident? Of course. You know, you can make it look accidental so nothing can be pinned on you. Now, I remember when I used to play ball, I swung so hard with my bat, it flew out of my hands. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I get you. Okay, leave it to me. I'll take care of that guy. But good. <laughs> Quite a big turnout for this game, Jim. Yeah, the semifinals playoff, that's why. Oh. Now all we have to do is win. How'd the team look in practice? Well, pretty sharp, Mr. Kent. How about Tommy Lee? He's in good form? Oh, yes, sir. He's got all his stuff today. Good. Take a look. He's over there next to the batting cage, warming up with mugs. Oh, yeah. Gee, what a sweet curve that boy throws. Oh, you said it. Tommy's the best pitcher in the boys' league. And he's got to face the best hitter in the league today. Oh, really? Who's that? Stuffy Miller, Central Playground's first baseman. Which one's he, Jim? Well, he hasn't come in yet. Oh, there he comes now. Uh, the Husky kid going to the batting cage. See him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Say, he looks like a tough baby. Yeah, he is. And boy, can he powder that old apple. Yeah, huh? I told Tommy to be sure not to give him anything good to hit at. Hey, look. Look, he's, he's set to hit one now. Hey. Wow, he missed it by a mile. Look at Mr. Ken, he swung so hard he fell down. Takes a wicked cut, all right. You better tell Tommy to move farther away. Tommy? Uh-huh. What for? Now, this stuffy lad jumps in to meet the pitch, and when he swings, he's out in front of the cage. If bat gets away from him, Tommy will be right in line for it. Oh, there's not much chance of that. Well, just the same, it's dangerous. Watch, now, here comes the pitch. Yeah, Stuffy jumps forward to meet it. He's out of the cage. Oh, his bat's flying out of his hands. He's going straight. Back. Look out, Tommy. No time to change clothes now. As Stuffy's heavy bat flies at Tommy Lee, whose back is turned to the batting cage, Clark Kent goes into action. There is only a dark blur through the air as he speaks across the diamond with the speed of light, snatches the whirling bat as it is about to strike Tommy Lee's head, and carries it out of sight beyond the field. Two minutes later, adjusting his hat and glasses, he emerges from the crowd around the diamond and rejoins the astonished Jimmy Olsen. Mr. Kent, what, what? Relax, Jim. Tommy wasn't hit. I know he wasn't, but but you, what? Where, what about me? Well, what happened to you? What do you mean? Well, you were right here beside me just a minute ago. And well? Then when the bat flew out of Stuffy's hands, you, you disappeared. I disappeared? Yeah. There was a kind of a blur through the air, and, and you just vanished. Hey, Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'll call play ball. You better forget everything else now, Jimmy. Get working on your team. I want to see you win this game. Well, you just watch it. See you later. Okay. This is your Daily Planet Sports reporter, folks, bringing you the latest report of the semifinal game in the boys' championship tournament between Unity House and Central Playground. At the end of the sixth inning, the score is Unity House 2, Central Playground nothing. So far, it's a shutout for Central with Tommy Lee, Unity House Hurler, pitching a perfect no-hit, no-run game. It's a home run. Hat up, boy, Muggs. Keep on going, boy. It makes it three to nothing in our favor, Mr. Kent. Uh-huh. All Tommy has to do is hold him two more innings and we're in. I got my fingers crossed, Jim. <laughs> reporter again will tell you that at the end of the eighth inning in the semifinal game between Unity House and Central Playground, the score is Unity House 3, Central Playground 1. 
Unity House pitcher Tommy Lee is pitching a bang-up game with 12 strikeouts so far, including Central's heaviest hitter, Stuffy Miller, who fanned out twice. <laughs> It's too bad they had to get another hit, Jim. It cuts down your margin. Yeah, but it's still three to two in our favor, Mr. Kent. If Tommy can just get by Stuffy Miller again, we win. Well, he's doing a beautiful job on that mound. Yeah, but if Stuffy gets hold of one, he'll hit it over that fence. Sure is shooting. Then it's so long ball game for us. Well, here's hoping Tommy can whiff him again. Yeah, he... Uh oh, another ball. Yeah. It makes it three and two. Here comes the payoff pitch. Nice work, Tommy! Second out, oh, boy! Hey, we're That's the finals! Add a boy, Tommy! As the Unity House players rush to surround Tommy Lee and shake his hand, and the crowd cheers wildly, Matt Riggs and Will Jenkins, scowling darkly, push their way out of the field to the street. Well, we're skunked again, Matt. Yeah. Now that chink kid, Tommy Lee, is the big hero of us here. All the papers will probably print his picture with a story about how terrific he is. Uh, don't you worry. We're going to give them something else to put in their dirty paper about that leak tomorrow. What do you mean? Call a special meeting of the action committee tonight in my garage. We fooled around long enough with these chinks. Now we're going to take our gloves off. What does Matt Riggs mean? We'll know in a moment when we return for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. It is 9.30 at night The Riggs garage behind locked doors and shrouded windows Twelve men garbed in the robes and hoods of the clan of the Fiery Cross Listen to the venomous, hate-scorched words of their grand scorpion, Matt Riggs A single candle set on the floor creates weird, grotesque shadows of shapeless, hooded men And the elongated, waving arms of their robed leader the time has come for action against these foreign scum who would dare demand equal rights with Americans. Look what they've done already. The Chinaman Dr. Lee wormed his way into the health department, stealing the job which our last mayor had promised me would go to one of our brothers, Will Jennings. Yes, that's right. Then Lee's son crowded my nephew Chuck off the Unity House baseball team. And to make sure he kept his job, he beamed Chuck yesterday, intending to kill him. Ah, uh, fine, thing. Well, let's do something about it. And today, because the players of the opposing team were afraid this murderous young whelp, Tommy Lee, would beam them too, they lost the game. And now Tommy Lee, a chink, is cheered and written up in the papers as a hero. Down, white up. Down, white up. I'm telling you, the time has come for real action. We must show the Lees and all their kind that we mean business that we intend to defend our homes and our families against them. Brothers, I propose that we go to the Lee house now and take that murderous boy, Tommy, and tar and feather him. Yeah. Well, wait a minute, Matt. Suppose the kid dies. Oh, let him die. It'll teach him all a lesson. Well, what do you say, brothers? Are you with me? Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Then get the truck out. The clan of the fiery cross acts tonight. <laughs> Using vicious lies, Matt Riggs inflames his followers into an attack on the innocent Lee home and young Tommy. An attack which may mean murder. What will happen now? Twice Superman has saved Tommy Lee and Jimmy Olsen from the cowardly attacks of the two-footed beasts who hide behind sheets and hoods. But Superman has no knowledge of this new and vicious threat. How can he find out in time to act? Tomorrow's episode is tense with drama and excitement, so don't miss a minute of it. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, the reprieve granted Tommy Lee by the swift action of Superman is short-lived as Matt Riggs, fanning the flames of hate, rides with his hooded followers to another cowardly attack. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. 
when Jimmy Olsen, as manager of the Unity House baseball team, selected a Chinese boy named Tommy Lee for his number one pitcher, he incurred the wrath of a band of intolerant bigots calling themselves the Clan of the Fiery Cross. The former pitcher, a boy named Chuck, was the nephew of Matt Riggs, Grand Scorpion of the Clan, whose un-American credo is one race, one religion, one color. Seeing an opportunity to extend his campaign of intolerance, Riggs harangued his followers into a fury against the innocent Chinese family by persuading his jealous nephew to say that Tommy Lee had tried to kill him. Following two cowardly attacks on Tommy, which were foiled by Superman, Riggs decided to tar and feather the boy. As we continue now, 12 of the robed and hooded bigots are climbing into a canvas-covered truck in the yard behind Matt Riggs' house, just as Chuck rides his bicycle into the driveway. Not wanting to be seen, the boy wheels quickly under a tree, remaining undetected in the darkness. Listen. We'll shell those rotten chinks and all others like them, won't we, brothers? Yeah. 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 Everybody set? Yeah, yeah. let's get the lead, kid. Okay, then, here we go. Eyes wide and heart pounding, young Chuck Riggs watches the truck carrying his uncle and the other hooded terrorists roar out of the dark driveway. Cheapers. They said something about getting Tommy Lee. I, I'd i better follow him. Pedaling as hard as he can, Chuck Riggs rides his bicycle out of the driveway just as the clan truck turns the corner. Then, his eyes fixed on his two winking red tail lights, he follows. Another turn, jouncing over the railroad tracks, and the truck comes to a stop, brakes squealing before a small, modest bungalow. Matt Riggs and his hooded clansmen leap to the pavement, strike down a police officer who starts to challenge them, then stride across the tiny patch of lawn onto Tommy Lee's front porch. Just as Chuck skids into the vacant lot across the street and throws himself panting to the ground, Matt knocks heavily on the door of the little house. Open the door, Tommy Lee! Open it up and hurry up! Holy smokes. That's the kid. That's the kid. Grab, boy. Come on, you dirty little Let punk. me go. Yes. Let me go, will you? Ah, we'll let you go when we get in. done with you. Hey, hands off what's me. going on here? Good heavens. Take your hands off my son. Oh. Take care of that silly foreigner, somebody. I, 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 I'm not a foreigner. I'm an American. Let my son alone. Don't you touch him. Uh, oh. Well, let's oh. take care of the old oh. man. Come on, now. Bring the kid out of the truck. You murderers. What did you do to my father? He got off easy compared to what you're going to get. Let me go. Let go of me. Yeah, nice hot coat of tar and feathers. Throw him in that truck and gag him. Let me go. Help. Help. In with you, you little yellow rat. Okay, rat. Okay, drive to the bend and step on it. into the night with young Tommy Lee and his brutal captors. Chuck Riggs scrambles to his feet in the vacant lot. He is sweating with fear and his legs shake under him. They're murderers. They're gonna kill Tommy. I can't let them do that. I, I gotta do something. The police. No, I'll get arrested. It was my fault because because I told lies about Tommy. I... Oh, what'll I do? I got it. I'll call Jim Olson. He'll know what... You no, know, he'll recognize my voice. But I gotta do something. I gotta. Oh, wait. I know. Yeah, this will do it. I gotta get to a telephone, but fast. Leaping on his bicycle, Chuck rides furiously toward a lighted drugstore in the distance. A few minutes later, a sleepy night telegraph operator in the deserted Daily Planet City room yawns and reaches for the ringing telephone at his side. <laughs> Hello, Daily Planet. Is Mr. Kent there, please? Kent? No, he left long ago. He did? Well, gosh, I gotta talk to him. Do you know where he went? I wouldn't know, bud. Call up in the morning. Bye. Wait, wait. I gotta talk to him, I tell you. I've gotta. Haven't you any idea where he is? How would I know where Kent is? I'm only the night wire man. Call up tomorrow. I can't wait till tomorrow. It's a matter of life or death. Look, could you tell me what his home number is? Hold on, bud. I guess it's in the book here. Oh, gee, thanks. Let's see. Here it is. Metropolis 4320. Metropolis 4320. Metropolis 4320. Thanks, mister. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Kent doesn't answer. Oh, jeepers, what'll I do? I just gotta talk to him. 
I've got to tell him about Tommy before... Before it's too late. Come on, Mr. Ken, answer your phone. Please answer. Desperately, Chuck Riggs tries again and again to reach Clark Kent, but in vain. Meanwhile, the truck carrying Tommy Lee and the hooded mobsters has crossed the Metropolis River to the wooded shores beyond. It is now lumbering down a narrow, little-used hill road whose shoulders drop away sharply into leafy darkness. That little kid's family will certainly beat it out of town after this, Matt. Yeah, think you can get me Lee's job in the health department then? Sure I can. Just leave it to me. Hey, come back here, kid. Grab him. The kid's getting away. What's the matter? The kid's getting away. Get him, Joe, quick. My slippery is a deal. Hold him, hold him. He's behind the truck. Hold him. He's gone. Stop the truck. Stop the truck after him, everybody. and hooded men stretch out in a long line and work their way slowly downhill through the thin woods. Their victim, Tommy Lee, crouches behind a fallen log at the edge of the swift-running river. His forehead is beaded with sweat and he hugs his throbbing right arm, broken in the leap from the truck. Blocking his teeth to prevent his crying out in pain, his heart hammers wildly as he hears his relentless pursuers draw closer and closer. They're coming closer and closer. What will I do? What will I do? See him yet, Will? Not yet. I'm a watch sharp. We're coming to the river. He must be around here someplace. Gosh, they're all around. They'll find me sure. They'll, they'll kill me. Keep your eyes peeled, Joe. We're going to get some of those punk any minute now. Look, there's the river. He must be right in here somewhere. I'll give him an extra coat of tar for this. Creepers, here they come. They'll find me now, sure. Well, they didn't have this broken arm. I could try to swim. I've got to go in the river anyhow. It's my only chance. And now I, I guess this is curtains. But here it goes. Will. What was that? What? Did you hear that big splash? Come on. Look. Look, there he is. Where? Where? In the river, don't you see? The car's taking around the bend. Holy sh... Come on, we got to get him on. No, no, wait. Let him alone. He won't last five minutes in those rapids. I know it, but we... Ah, oh, the river's done our job, Will. Now we gotta get out of here fast. Okay, boys, everybody back the truck. Pausing only a moment to watch the swift current seize the painfully injured Tommy Lee and sweep him into the torrent of deep rushing water pouring around the bend. The robed and hooded clan, their murderous work done, turn and hurry up back through the woods to their truck. Meanwhile, several miles away in Metropolis, Chuck Riggs, suffering the pangs of conscience, is still in the drugstore telephone booth calling Clark Kent's telephone number over and over again. Keep ringing, operator. I've got to get Mr. Kent. I've got to. Or maybe I'll be a... a murderer. How near is Chuck to the truth? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the dramatic climax of today's episode. So stand by. Aware now that his own jealousy and lies had brought about the tragic attack on young Tommy Lee by the clan of the Fiery Cross, Chuck Riggs has been for some time attempting to reach Clark Kent by phone from a drugstore. Suddenly, the door of the booth is thrust open. Look, Sonny, expect to stay in this phone booth all night? Huh? Oh, no, as soon as I get this call, I'll be out. You've been in there half an hour. Get out now and give me a chance. I can't, mister. This call is awful important. So is mine. I can't wait around all night while you talk to your girl. I'm not calling a girl. You see it. Come on now. Get out and let me make my call. I have the manager of the store throw you out. But jeepers. Besides, you ought to be in bed at this hour. Now, get out. Oh, gosh. Well, oh, all right. Forced to leave the phone booth, Chuck Riggs hangs up at the very moment that Clark Kent, returning to his apartment, hears the phone ringing, opens the door quickly, and rushes across the room. Hello? 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 Hmm. Nobody on the line. I wonder who wanted me. No. I hope it wasn't anything important. Downing Clark Kent, whom we know to be Superman, the one person who might still be able to save Tommy Lee, replaces the telephone, unaware that by a grim stroke of fate, by the merest fraction of a second... Tommy's doom may have been sealed. What will happen now? 
as the vicious clan of the Fiery Cross, the cowardly men who murder at night hidden behind their sheets and hoods, succeeded in doing away with an innocent boy whose only crime in the eyes of his attackers is that his skin is a different color from theirs. No. We're sure Superman can still find out in time to save Tommy and defeat the men of hate. But how? Monday tells the story, so be sure to be with us then. Tune in Monday, same time, same station. Don't miss a single minute of the next thrilling episode in this expose of fanatical and un-American bigotry. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, the fate of Tommy Lee rests, strangely enough, in the hands of Chuck Riggs, whose desperate attempt to reach Clark Kent has thus far ended in failure. And now, the adventures of Superman. Jealous because Jimmy Olsen, manager of the Unity House baseball team, had replaced him in the pitcher's slot with a Chinese boy named Tommy Lee, young Chuck Riggs went with his uncle to a meeting of the Clan of the Fiery Cross whose un-American credo is one race, one religion, one color. Coached by his Uncle Matt, leader of the hooded mob, Chuck said that Tommy had tried to kill him. Incensed and seeing an opportunity to start a wave of terror, the Klansmen snatched up the Chinese boy and carried him away to tar and feather him. The boy managed to leap from their speeding truck, but broke his arm in the fall. And as he hid in a patch of woods, the cowardly horde in robes and hoods closed in on him. Terrified and in pain, Tommy threw himself into the river and was swept by the swift current toward a seething rapids. Meanwhile, tortured by his conscience, Chuck Riggs has been unsuccessfully attempting to contact Clark Kent by telephone. Kent entered his apartment just as Chuck, forced out of a phone booth, hung up. But as we continue now, Kent's phone is ringing again. Listen. Hello? Hello. Is, is this Mr. Kent? Yes, who's calling? I, uh, I can't tell you, but listen, Mr. Kent. A friend said you'd gotten lots of guys out of trouble. What? Maybe you can help Tommy Lee. Tommy Lee? What happened to him? The clan of the Fiery Cross got him. What? Yeah, they're going to tar and feather him. Wait, Scott, when was this? Where? Tonight, just a little while ago. They grabbed him and, and took him away in a truck. Oh, gosh, you got to do something. You just... All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where did they take him? Do you know? My uncle... I mean, they said something about going to the bend. Jeepers, the Mr. bend? Kent. The river bend? I don't know. I just heard him say the bend. Listen, somebody better do something. I'll do everything I can. Me. Goodbye. Off with these clothes. <clears throat> to those rotten hate mongers. That's Superman. Now, if only I'm not too late to stop them. Stripping off his business suit, Clark Kent stands revealed in the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Swiftly, he steps to the window and opens it. Out. Up. And away. <laughs> Leaping out into the night sky, Superman streaks across the great city, over the wide metropolis river and to the low foothills, where a narrower, swifter running river tumbles down from the mountains, bends around a patch of woods, and rushes over a boiling rapids on its way to empty into Metropolis Harbor. Suddenly, the Man of Steel checks his rocket-like flight over the patch of woods in which young Tommy Lee had tried vainly to elude his hooded pursuers. There's the bend, but I don't see Tommy or any clansmen. Either I'm too late or... Wait a minute. What's that caught between those two rocks? That's Tommy. And the current is dragging him into the rapids. Down to him. Down! Tommy. Tommy. Poor kid, he's unconscious. What's more, this arm is broken. He's in bad shape. Got to get him to a hospital. Up! Up! And away! Leaping up from the seething rapids with the limp, battered body of Tommy Lee in his arms, Superman streaks back to Metropolis and deposits the boy at the General Hospital. A short time later, once more in his guise and garb of Clark Kent, he speaks to a hospital physician. How is Tommy Lee, Doctor? He's suffering from shock and exposure, and he has a broken arm, but he'll pull through. Oh, that's fine. May I see him? Not tonight, Mr. Kent. The boy needs rest and quiet. 
We've given him a sedative to make him sleep. I see. By the way, Tommy kept asking for his father when he regained consciousness. Yes, well... He seemed very much concerned about him. I think it would be advisable for Dr. Lee to be here in the morning when Tommy wakes up. I'm afraid that won't be possible. You see, Dr. Lee was slugged by the same cowardly gang that almost murdered his son. Good heavens! But why? Well, I know Lee's a fine chap, and he's done some excellent work in bacteriology. Uh, you know a man's worth means nothing to those fanatical hooded gangsters. The dirty cowards. Look here, Mr. Kent, this is an outrage. Can't something be done about Believe it? Believe me, Doctor, something will be done about it as soon as possible. I've got to go to police headquarters now, but here. Here's my card. It has both my home and office telephone numbers on it. If anything develops, call me at once, will you please? I certainly will. Thank you. Good night, Doctor. <laughs> Has Henderson found out who those scoundrels are yet? Well, he knows they're the clan of the Fiery Cross, Chief. Well, we all know that now. But who are the rats behind those sheets and hoods? We haven't found that out yet. No, you haven't? No. Then what have you found out? Well, frankly, very little. And you can't blame the police, because until this happened, no one knew the clan was organized in Metropolis. And except for the police officer they slugged in front of the Lee house, and Tommy and his father, no one has even seen them before. Oh, can't they identify at least one of those rats? Oh. All the officer and Tommy and Dr. Lee saw was a gang of hooded men. No, no, not men. Cowardly hyenas. Well, Real men don't hide behind sheets and gang up on someone just because he goes to a different church or, or because his skin happens to be a different color. Now, look, Kent, the boy who phoned you last night, he knew the clan was going to tar and feather Tommy Lee and he knew where they were taking him. Wouldn't he know who they were? Possibly. Well, who was the boy? Well, that's the $64 question. What do you mean? Now, don't tell me you didn't have sense enough to ask him who he was. Well, sure, I asked him, but he wouldn't tell me. He wouldn't? No. I never heard his voice before. But if we could find that boy, I think we could find out who some of the clansmen are. Well, we've got to find him. Well, that's fine, but how? Our only clue to him is his voice. We can't go around and pick up every boy in Metropolis and question him. No, but... Wait a minute, Chief. Wait a minute. I just thought of something. What? Let's run a front-page letter in the Daily Planet addressed to that boy, showing him that, that not only Tommy Lee, but he and every other boy in America who doesn't part his hair the way the clan likes is in danger. We'll ask him to come to us, or to the police. You've got something there, Kent, but I'll go you one better. What? I'll run a letter addressed to everyone in Metropolis and offer a $1,000 reward to anyone who can reveal the identity of a single cowardly member of that rotten gang of hooded murderers. Good. Swell idea. I'll smoke those skunks out from behind their sheets, or my name isn't Perry White. <laughs> The Daily Planet? Yeah, just now. I don't like it, Matt. One of the brother's kids or somebody else who knows who we are might be tempted by that reward. Yeah, we gotta stop that rotten sheet from attacking us and get them to cut out that reward stuff or they'll get in the way of our work. Right, but how can we? The planet's a big newspaper. Oh, uh, there's ways to handle it. Look, call the members of the action committee. Tell them to meet tonight in my garage as soon as it gets dark. You got that? Check. Okay, get going. Tonight we'll show that Daily Planet bunch they ain't big enough to stop the clan of the Fiery Cross. Replacing the telephone, Matt Briggs, grand scorpion of the clan of the Fiery Cross, sits staring into the half-shadows of his library, his mad slaty eyes cold and unwinking as those of a jungle beast. What plot is he hatching up against our friends on the Daily Planet? We'll return in a moment for the dramatic climax of today's episode. So stand by. Now, late that same evening, Editor Perry White at the wheel of his car is driving Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen out to his suburban home. Well, it looks as if so far that first page letter in the Daily Planet was a washout. Don't give up hope yet, Jim. No, give it a chance. Gee whiz, the first edition came out at noon. Not one person's called up yet to give us the name of a clansman. Well, we might get some calls tonight. I sure hope so. I want to get the guys who did that to Tommy Lee. Gosh, Mr. Kent... He darn near broke me up when I went to see him this afternoon. What do you mean, Jim? Well, he, he didn't say a word about what had happened to him or his father. He just said, sorry, I won't be able to help you win the championship game next week, Jim. Hmm. What's that truck, Chief? Hey! 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 Stop talking about Tommy. I get so sore, I can't see where I'm driving. Well, I'm sore, too. 
Bad chance we've got to win next week without Tommy in the box. Well, what's happened is much more important than a ball game, Jim. Oh, sure, I know. I found out what hate mongers are like when we tangled with Frank Hill and his mom. Only it gets me so mad. What right is the clan or anybody else to pick on a swell kid like Tommy Lee because his color is different? What business is it there of theirs what color his skin is? None of their business, confound it. They're a bunch of ignorant fanatics. Keep that car! Get over on your... Okay, okay. Close. Yeah, a little too close for comfort. You're not kidding. Does it I get so blame mad when Tomorrow, I... Tomorrow, don't drive when you're angry. Fortunately, we're practically at the house. I think you turn at the next corner, Chief. Uh, don't you think I know my own street? I just thought I'd remind you. Well, I just got an idea for an editorial for tomorrow's paper, Mr. Kent. How about... Wait a minute. Chief, look. Well, what's the matter? Up ahead, on your lawn. Well, gee whiz. Good. Good Godfrey. A flaming cross. Their eyes wide, Clark Kent, Perry White, and Jim Olsen stare ahead at Perry White's lawn, on which burns a wooden cross, symbol of the dreaded plan of the fiery cross. The cowardly men of hate and bigotry who stalk at night, anonymous in their robes and hoods, have dared to warn Editor White that he is next on their list. What will happen now? A great deal happens tomorrow, fellows and girls. So be sure to be with us. Same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, E, P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, the Daily Planet's attack on the clan of the Fiery Cross has brought their vengeance down on Perry White, and the symbol of hatred burns again, this time at the door of the gray-haired editor. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. On the clan of the Fiery Cross, a group of intolerant fanatics attacked a Chinese boy named Tommy Lee, star pitcher on Jimmy Olsen's Unity House baseball team. Only the prompt action of Superman saved the innocent boy's life. Furious, editor Perry White published a scathing editorial against the clan in the Daily Planet and offered a $1,000 reward to anyone who could identify a single one of the robed and hooded bigots. That night... When White, Jimmy, and Clark Kent drove up to the editor's suburban home, they were startled to see a huge cross of fire burning on White's front lawn. Listen. Great Scott. Look, Chief. Oh, gee whiz. A burning cross. That's the symbol of the Klan. It means those hate mongers have selected you as their next victim, Chief. Sleeping lizards, no, they can't. Quick, we've got to call the fire department. Well, don't bother. Someone's already done that. Come on, Chief, pull out of their way. Good night. Good night, Mr. Pittman, and thanks for your offer, but we'll be all right. Boy, I thought your neighbors would never leave, Chief. Yeah, so did I. Well, yeah, hasn't this been an exciting half hour? Yes, and frightening, too. Frightening? Huh. If this was meant to frighten me, it was a total waste of time. Holy smokes, Chief. Don't you know what a burning cross means? Why, sure I know. It's a warning for me to lay off the clan. But I'll be hanged if I'll knuckle under to a bunch of ignorant cowards who hide behind hoods and sheets. Yeah, these men are dangerous. Granted, they're cowardly. They're still dangerous while they remain anonymous. And how? But look, what I can't figure out, Mr. Kent, is why they're picking on Mr. White. He's no foreigner, and his skin's and not... The reason's obvious, Jim. You mean it's because of my editorial telling of the rotten history of the clan and pointing out the un-American bigotry they stand for? Exactly. Well, they won't make me shut up. I'll keep after them until they're brought out into the open and... Sure, sure, I know you will, Chief, but you must take precautions. I can't watch over you every minute. You? Uh, I, I mean, uh, we. That is, I'm sure Inspector Henderson will assign a couple of plain clothes men, but even Not they... to me, he won't. I'm not going to let those scoundrels think I'm scared of them. Oh, but look, Chief. I think Mr. Kent is right. I don't care what you think, or Kent either. The Klan is going to find out that I mean business, and that they can't scare me with their mumbo-jumbo and burning crosses. But you can Now, no more arguments. First, we'll have something to eat, and then we'll go to work. Pogo! Say, that's strange. Pogo isn't here, Chief. Well, of course he's here. Pogo! Oh, I tell you, he isn't here. Then I tell you, he is. I talked to him just before we left the office. Told him to have some supper ready for us. But... Pogo! 
Where are you, you lazy beggar? He's not in the kitchen. Polo! Well, maybe he's in his room, Mr. White. No, he isn't there either. Oh, how do you know he isn't, Mr. Kent? He can't see from here. Oh, no. Well, I, I, I just well, got a feeling he isn't. Funny, he's, he's not in his room either. And he didn't finish preparing supper. The stuff spread all around the kitchen and the refrigerator is open. Hey, I don't like this. Hey, maybe he got scared by the burning cross and went upstairs. No, I tell you, he isn't... Sure, anywhere. that's probably what happened. He's probably under my bed, scared to death. Come on, we'll go up and get him. No, don't bother. He isn't upstairs, Chief. Kent, are you trying to tell me that you can look through the ceiling like Superman? Oh, no, no, but uh, I, I tell you, he... Great Scott! Huh? Well, what's the matter? The garage! Come on, follow me! <laughs> See? There's Poco, Chief. Where? Over there, lying in the corner of the garage. What? Jeepers. What's the matter with him? Poco. Oh, I can't hear you, Jim. He's unconscious. Unconscious? Yes. Unconscious. Poor little fellow. Well, what happened to him? Wait, let's have a look. I'll turn him over. Is he alive? Yes, but... Gosh, look at his face. All, all cut up and... Good heavens. The poor chap must have been in an accident. I don't think it was an accident, Chief. I think Poco was beaten up. Beaten? Oh, who'd want to beat up poor little Poco, Mr. Kent? He... Why, he never heard a fly. Tommy Lee and his father never heard anyone either, Jim. Tommy Lee and his father? You mean... The Fiery Cross Gang? Yes. Unless I miss my guess, our friends in the hoods and sheets did this dirty piece of work. The rats. The dirty rats. Jim, you run ahead and get the first aid kit out, will you? I'll carry Poco into the house. Hurry. Take it easy now. Uh, Drink a little more water, Poco. Uh, easy. Uh, there. How do you feel now? Oh, woe is me. Such misery. Do you hurt very much, Poco? My body, Jim, is a mass of pain. I'm sure I'll never walk again. Oh, you'll walk all right. Why, yes, of course you will. Who did this to you, Poco? Some terrible men who sneaked out of the night. Oh, dear. They gave me such a fright. Each wore a sheet and a hood over his head like ghosts came back from the dead. They weren't ghosts, Poco. They were the clan of the Fiery Cross. The scoundrels. Now, what happened, Poco? Uh, why did they beat you up? They were burning a cross upon our lawn. I was frightened, but I told them to be gone. They struck me down and kicked me, too. That's all I recall till I saw you. Except, uh, except they said... Why, the dirty... Just a moment, Jim. What did they say, Poco? I'm so hurt and oh, so sore... I can hardly talk anymore. Well, just try to tell us what they said, Poco. They said, tell White, we'll get him to, unless he lays off us in his newspaper. Oh, oh, said they'd get me, eh? Well, we'll see who gets home. If they think they can shut me up by burning a cross on my lawn, by beating up poor Poco, well, just wait till they see the Daily Planet tomorrow. <laughs> You will. For men, I... What are you uh, jumpy about, Frank? The latest story in the Daily Planet raising the reward for us to five grand? Yeah, that's a lot of dough, Will. Somebody might get tempted to take a chance and spill on us. Well, well, that's why I'm here. Matt Riggs says for you to be ready for action at six o'clock tonight. You got that? Yeah. What's going to happen? You'll find out tonight. Be ready for action at six. Glad you dropped in, Will. I want to ask you about the new story in the planet about us. How did the White raise the reward of $5,000? I know all about it, George. That's why I'm here. Matt Riggs says for you to be ready for action at 6 o'clock tonight. At 6, huh? What are we going to do? You'll find out tonight. Just be ready for action at 6 o'clock. Hey, I'm glad you showed up, Will. Look, you tell Matt we got to do something about that lousy daily planet. He's a way ahead of you, Hank. We're going to take care of that tonight. Yeah, that's what Matt said last night, but the burning cross didn't shut White's big mouth. He's raising such a fuss, every cop in Metropolis is looking for we us. We know, we know, but don't worry. He won't raise any more fuss after tonight, Hank. I'll guarantee you that. You just be ready for action at 6 o'clock. This is going to be the works. Going from one clansman to another, Will Jennings, the mouthpiece for Matt Riggs, Grand Scorpion of the clan of the Fiery Cross, gives the order to stand by for action tonight. What will happen? We'll know in just a moment. So stand by for the tense climax of today's episode. At a quarter past six that same evening, Daily Planet editor Perry White impatiently drums his fingers on the desk in his office. 
then rises to his feet. Well, come on, Olson. We're going home. Going home? But you promised to wait for Mr. King. I know, I know. But he said he'd be here at 6 and it's 6.15 now. Our editorial said for anyone wanting to give information about the clan after 6 o'clock to call me at home. So we'd better get going. I don't want to risk missing a call. Oh, but Mr. Kent said for you not to leave the office without him. Mr. Kent said. Is he running this newspaper or am I? Well, you are, I guess, but I... You guess? Well, well, sure. Of course you are. But Mr. Kent said you were in danger of him not to leave until he got here. He said he might be a little later than six, but he said... If the... you don't stop that he said stuff, I... Oh, now, I... look. You she... quiet, quiet. What do you and Kent think I am? A babe in arms? No, but... But we... nothing. The plan wouldn't dare lay a finger on me. They were just trying to scare me into turning off the heat on them. I don't know about that. I think... Well, that... I do know. I'll get your hat and come along. I tell you, Mr. Kent's going to be awful sore when he gets to the planet and finds you gone, Mr. White. Yeah, I'm shuddering in my boots. Do you think he'll fire me? I don't think it's any joking matter. Those fiery cross clan guys are bad actors. They... What's that fool blowing his horn for? I don't know. Maybe you better pull over, Mr. White. Looks like he wants to pass us. Well, let him. I'm doing 35. That's the legal speed limit on this highway. I'm on my side of the road. Here he comes. Hey, get over there. What are you trying to do? It's a truck. I don't care what it is. He's calling us off the road. Hey, watch out. Look out, hey. Mr. White. You're going off the road. Well, that was too close. That stupid truck driver deliberately crowded us off the road. Almost sent us into the ditch. Believe me, I'll tell him a thing or two. Hey, wait, Chief. Look. I'm waiting for nothing. I'm going to... Holy smokes. Look. Those men jumping out of the truck. They're wearing sheets and hoods. Good God, Frey. They're, they're the clan of the Fiery Cross. Their blood suddenly running cold. Jimmy Olsen and Perry White sit rigidly in their car as some 20 robed and hooded men leap from the truck and run threateningly toward them. What will happen to gray-haired editor White and his young reporter with Superman unaware that they are now trapped by the hate-mongering bigots of the clan of the Fiery Cross? There's much excitement ahead, so don't miss tomorrow's thrilling episode, gang. Tune in, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, with Clark Kent's admonition to remain at the Daily Planet gone unheeded, Perry White and Jimmy Olsen have fallen into the hands of enemies, the hooded mobsters of the Clan of the Fiery Cross. Now, the adventures of Superman. When Tommy Lee, spectacular boy pitcher and star player on Jim Olsen's Unity House baseball team, was brutally attacked by the hate-mongering clan of the Fiery Cross because he is Chinese, editor Perry White printed a blistering editorial against the cowardly hooded band whose un-American credo is one race, one religion, one color. White's editorial was accompanied by an offer of $1,000 to whomever would reveal the identity of a clansman. That night, a fiery cross was planted on White's lawn as a warning. Furious and far from intimidated, White published another editorial attack against the fanatical bigotry of the hooded clan, raising his offer to $5,000 for identification of its membership. Ignoring Kent's admonition to stay in the office until his return, White and Jim Olson drove off to the editor's support bourbon home. En route, they are forced to stop by a large truck, which, as our story continues now, is disgorging some 20 men, all garbed in long sheets and slitted hoods, who mutter angrily as they rush toward White and Jim. Holy smokes. Look, Chief, it, it's... There's a clan of the fiery cross. Come on, boys. You know what to do. You bet we do. Quick, Chief. Stop, stop the car. Maybe we can get away. No, no, Jim. It's too late. Take your hands off me, you... Hey, let go. Let go. Let, let go. Let, go. let, let him have it, Joe. Oh, good work. Why, you dirty rat. Just let me get my hands Look at you. him, too, Joe. Hey, fast. No. Oh. Ah, nice oh. going. All right, boys. Pick him up and toss him into the truck. Mike, you drive their car. Follow us. Let's go. Throwing the unconscious Jimmy Olsen and Perry White into their truck, the robed and hooded clansmen leap in after them, and a moment later, roar away. Meanwhile, in his guise of Clark Kent, Superman has returned to the Daily Planet. 
Failing to find White and Jimmy, he has entered Lois Lane's office where the girl reporter is typing a story. Listen, Lois, did you just see the... Just a moment, the... Clark. I'm finishing the story on Dr. Lee. What? You know, Tommy Lee's father. Well, all right, that's fine, but will you please stop typing a moment and listen to me? This is important. Okay, okay. There. Now, what's on your mind? Have you seen the chief and Jimmy? Yes, I saw them about, oh, half an hour ago when I got back to the office. They were just leaving. Leaving? For where? For the chief's house. Why? Oh, of all the stubborn... I told him not to leave the office without me. You told who? The chief. Do you mind if I use your phone? Well, of course not. Look, what's all the excitement about? What do you mean? Don't you know about the cross being burned on the chief's lawn last night? And Poco getting beaten up? Of course I know about it, but has something else happened now? I don't know. I hope not. You hope not? Clark, I wish you'd explain what's eating you. I'm worried about the chief, Lois. That fiery cross was the clan's warning to him to stop attacking them in the Daily Planet or else. You know that, don't you? Oh, sure, but they were just bluffing. Bluffing? Well, you know they wouldn't dare do anything to an important man like the editor of the Daily Planet. Oh, that's what you think. Oh, why doesn't somebody answer? Who are you calling? Mr. White's house. Well, well, poor Poco can't answer. He's in bed, you know, under a doctor's care. Oh, I know, but the nurse, Miss Adams, is there. She... Oh, wait a minute, here she is. Hello, Miss Adams. Uh, this is Clark Kent. Yes, did Mr. White and Jim Olsen get there yet? They didn't. Well, I... Yes, I know you're expecting them. Uh Uh-huh. Well, look, will you ask Mr. White to phone me the moment he comes in, please? I'm at the office. That's right, at the Daily Planet. Thank you. Goodbye. Not home yet? Uh Uh-uh. And that worries me. Say, they left a half hour ago, Lois? Well, about that. They should be home because it doesn't take much more than half an hour to drive out there. Now, stop worrying, Clark. For heaven's sake. I can't when I think of the clan of the Fiery Cross and what they do. Oh, stop it, Clark. You know those cowards attack people who can't defend themselves and whom they think they can scare into silence, like little Tommy Lee and his father. Why, they wouldn't dare attack Perry White. Well, ordinarily you'd be right, Lois. But they can't afford to have a big paper like the Planet blasting them and offering $5,000 rewards for information about them. Well... They've got to shut up the chief or stop their dirty work. I think they wouldn't dare touch him. And I tell you, they're wrong. I'll wait another ten minutes. If the chief isn't home by then, I'm going out to look for him. For heaven's sake, who are you calling now, Clark? White's house. The ten minutes are up. Goodness, I never knew you were such a warrior. Look, I've had too much experience with these fanatical hate mongers not to worry, Lord. Oh, hello, Miss Adams. This is Clark Kent again. Did Mr. White and Jim Olsen get there yet? No, they haven't. Well, did you hear from them at all? I see. No, 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 no other message. All right, thank you. Goodbye. You're not home. No. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Look for the chief and Jimmy. I've got a hunch they're in trouble. Now you've got me worried. I'll go with you. No, I can work faster alone. Don't be silly. How can you? You'd be surprised. So long. Hurrying to the deserted storeroom, Kent strips off his business suit, revealing the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Swiftly, he opens the window. Out. Up. And away! Like an arrow shot from a giant bow, Superman flashes away from the Daily Planet, rocketing above the highway leading to Editor White's suburban home. A moment later, he is hovering above White's house, sees his friends are not there, and returns to scour the highway and the nearby countryside again. Later, more worried than ever, he has resumed his guise of Clark Kent and is in the office of Inspector Henderson at Metropolis Police Headquarters. You say you've checked with the highway police, Inspector? Yes, and with all the hospitals. There's been no report of anything happening to Mr. White and Jim. Oh. Or of anyone seeing them after they left the planet this evening. Well, then I'm positive the clan of the Fiery Cross is behind their disappearance. You've got to track them down. Now, wait a minute, Kent. The clansmen are bad actors, but they pick on little people. They only try to frighten the big ones. They tried to frighten Mr. White, and it didn't work, so they had to go farther. They knew if they didn't silence him, he'd silence them eventually. Yes, Believe me, Kent... Inspector, I know what I'm talking about. Now, we've got to work fast. We may never see Mr. White and Jimmy again. We've got to track down that clan. Yeah, well, how are we going to do that? We don't even know who those devils are. All right, we've got to find out. Now, look, that boy who called me the other night to tell me the clan was going to tar and feather Tommy Lee, he knows who the clansmen are. Now, if we can find him, we... Oh, sure, if, if, if. I've had all phone exchanges trying to trace that call, and my men are asking questions everywhere, but it's no soap. Trouble is, we haven't got a description of the boy. I know. Oh, uh, just a minute, that's my phone. Hello? Oh, yes, Healy. What? You have, huh? Oh, that's fine. Well, where are you? 
Third in Maine? Right. Right, we'll be right out. That was Healy, Kent. Yes? He's picked up a boy he thinks might be the one who phoned you the other night. Wonderful. Let's go. We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Clark Kent and Inspector Henderson have just arrived at 3rd and Main Streets, where Sergeant Healy reported picking up a boy who might be the mysterious youngster who had telephoned Kent the night the clan of the Fiery Cross attacked young Tommy Lee. Where's the boy, Healy? I let him go, Inspector. What? You let him go? Yeah, I called you back, but you'd already left. This kid was acting suspiciously two nights ago when the Lee boy was grabbed by the clan. Also, we made a phone call from a pool room to someone, he wouldn't say who, about the time Mr. Kent got the call. Yeah? But when I checked back on my notes, I saw where Mr. Kent had said the kid who phoned him didn't have any accent. No, he didn't. Well, this kid had a southern accent. Uh Uh-oh. Well, it might have been a phony one. It wasn't. I made sure. I checked with people around here who knew him and his folks. Up in the south, all right. Well, I guess that's that, Kent. Not on your life, Inspector. We've still got to find a lead to the clan because I'm sure they've got Jim and Mr. White. I'm afraid that unless we get to them quickly, it'll be too late. Mark Kent's fear is well-founded. For at this moment in the clan's hideout high in the craggy hills above Metropolis, Jimmy and White sit in a small, dark cave, their hands bound tightly behind them with wire. Outside the cave entrance, two ghostly figures in robes and hoods keep watch. Other hooded figures stand guard elsewhere in the moonlit glade. What do you think's going to happen to us, Mr. White? Nothing, Jim. Not a thing. They wouldn't dare do anything to us. That's what you said last night, after they burned the cross on your lawn. Ah, they're just bluffing now, trying to scare us. You can't kid me. You don't believe that any more than I do. You know these guys mean business. Rubbish. Sheer nonsensical rubbish. Oh, yeah? I got a feeling we're in for the works. I heard one of the guys say their grand... Grand Scorpion was coming up here tonight, and it was going to be just too bad for us. And I say it'll be too bad for him and for all of his dirty gang if they so much as lay a finger on us. I... Hold it, Chief. Here comes one of the rats. Well, let him come. I'll tell him a thing or two. All right, White. All send up in your feet. Now, look here, you. Shut you... up and do as you're told. Wait, you... Chief, please. Well, the, the idea... Grand dirty... Scorpion wants to see you. Follow me. The who? You heard me. The Grand Scorpion of the clan That of... Grand Baloney. Now, you listen to me. If you know what's good for you, look, you'll... White. If you know what's good for you, you'll shut your face and do as you're told. We don't aim to take any more from you, you understand? Now, come on. Move. Shoved roughly from the cave, Jim Olsen and Perry White follow the hooded ruffian across the moonlit glade to a secluded spot where Matt Riggs, the cold-eyed leader of the clan of the Fiery Cross, awaits them. What will happen? Tomorrow's episode is tense with action and drama. So don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Jimmy Olsen and Perry White, captives of the Clan of the Fiery Cross, await their interview with the Grand Scorpion, puzzled as to how far the bigoted leader will dare to go. The Adventures of Superman. When the clan of the Fiery Cross, a group of hate mongers whose credo is one race, one color, attacked Tommy Lee, star pitcher on Jimmy Olsen's Unity House baseball team, because he is Chinese, Editor Perry White offered $5,000 reward to anyone who could identify the cowardly Klansman. That night, the men in sheets and hoods seized White and Jim and carried them to a hideout in the hills high above Metropolis. While Superman and the police searched for them, the gray-haired editor and the young reporter, their hands bound, were brought to a large cave, before which burns a fiery cross, symbol of the clan, whose leaping flames eerily illuminate the cave where Matt Riggs, leader of the intolerant band, stands, garbed in a long robe embroidered with a blue scorpion. A peaked hood, slit to reveal only his cold, sleepy eyes, covers his head and face. Arms crossed on his chest, 
Riggs stares at White and Jim as they approach. So, you are the high monkey monkey of this bunch, eh? I'm the grand scorpion of the clan of the Fiery Cross. The grand rat, you mean? And a couple of other names I could think of, you... Chief, you... please. I advise you to control your temper, Mr. White, and your tongue. I don't want any advice from you, but I'll give you some. Release us at once, or by heaven, you and every one of your hooded hooligans will go to the electric chair. You're in no position to threaten us, but the time you're found in these hills, it'll be too late. Unless you come to terms first. Terms? Well, what do you mean? You've got to agree to stop your tax on us and your newspaper with your dirty lies. Stop standing up for those... Those yellow foreigners. They're not foreigners. They're darn good Americans. A whole lot better than you are. Quiet, you young punk. The Lees are American citizens, entitled to the same privileges as any of us. They're not Americans. They're foreigners. Their skin isn't white. So what? The Indians who were here before us are red-skinned. Does that make them foreigners? I'm not talking about the Indians. You are talking rot, and you know it. The nation was founded by foreigners and built by foreigners. Everyone here either came from another country or is descended from folks who did. Don't you ever read your history, you, 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 you stupid bigot? That's telling him, Chief. Now, look here, you two. I warn you, I'm not going to waste any more talk on you. Oh, good. Then you listen to me. I happen to love my country and what it stands for. Equal rights and privileges for all Americans, regardless of what church they choose to worship God in or what color skin God gave them. Now, you wait a minute. The United States was founded on that principle, and we've just fought a second world war to preserve it. You and others like you with your diseased minds want to tear down what we've built and fought to keep. But you can't do it. Blast you. I'll fight you to the last breath. And so will every other American worth his salt. We'll flush you and your hate-peddling goons out from behind your dirty sheets and clap you in jail where you belong. Atta boy, Chief. Now, put that in your pipe and smoke it, Mr. Rat. You fools. Do you think that you or anyone else can stop the clan of the fiery cross? You bet we can. And we will. We stopped Hitler, mister. And his outfit sold the same baloney as yours. All right. I'll just show you how we'll deal with those who stand in the clan's way. Joe! Yeah? Tell the brothers to start heating the tar. Get those feathers ready. What? Tar and feathers? Jim, is he? Look, you're mad. It might kill him, you know. After all, this old goat is no... I don't care who he is or what he is. Do as I say. Okay, you're the boss. Ralph, join. Fill the clan with that stuff. Now, don't move, you two. We'll see how brave you are when the hot tar touches your skin. Now, now, look, wait a minute. Don't you... let him scare you, Jim. He, he wouldn't dare do anything to us. I'm not so sure, Chief. I, I think they are going to tar and feather us. Nonsense, nonsense. This fellow is just trying to scare us into doing what he wants. Well, maybe, but did you notice the way he looked just then? I mean, the way his eyes shone? I think he's cracked. Well, of course he is. All fanatics are. Well, but... what's the matter, Joe? There's no tar. What? Yeah, Ralph says that last storm knocked the barrels off the ledge. They rolled down into the stream and broke open. Oh, boy, what a break. Well, what are you waiting for? Get some more tar. How are we going to get any tar in these hills? Oh, I don't know. Look, I've got to go back to town, so you come along and ride with me. We'll pick up a barrel at home, bring it back in the morning. Okay. What do we do with White and Olsen for Lent? The other boys can stand guard on them. They'll keep till we get back. Come on. <laughs> Granted a few hours' reprieve, Jimmy Olsen and Perry White are returned to the small cave across the glade where robed and hooded clansmen stand guard. Meanwhile, unable to find a trace of his friends, Superman and his guise of Clark Kent has returned to the Daily Planet where Lois Lane greets him anxiously. Any luck, Clark? No. The boy the police picked up was the wrong one. What's all this about a boy? You started to tell me before, but you didn't finish. Oh, well, you see, Lois, some unidentified boy phoned me the night the clan grabbed Tommy Lee. Yes? He told me the clan was taking Tommy to the river bend to tar and feather him. I see. And he wouldn't tell you his name? No, but he knew all about it. So he must know who the clansmen are. Hey, wait a minute. I'm going to try something. Try what? What I wanted the chief to do the other day. Run an open letter on the first page of the Daily Planet addressed to that boy. A letter explaining that, well, that, that not only Tommy Lee and Jim Olson, but every boy in America who... Who parts his hair a way the clan doesn't like, or who refuses to bow down to those bullies, is in danger of his life. But, Clark... I believe that boy must have a sense of honor which prompted him to call me to help Tommy Lee. But why wouldn't he give you his name? Oh, well, probably because he was afraid of being found out by the clan. Yes, he must have taken a great risk even to phone me. Well, now I'm going to appeal again to his sense of honor and fair play. Well, you go ahead if you like, but I don't think it'll work, Clark. If he was afraid before... I think it will work. Anyhow, it's our only chance. Look, Lois, you call Donovan, will you? Yes. Tell him what's up and ask him to call the pressman and get them down here at once. Okay. We're going to put out a special early morning edition of The Planet. Unaware that 
that the mysterious boy is Chuck Riggs, nephew of the Grand Scorpion of the Clan of the Fiery Cross. Clark Kent composes an open letter to him to be displayed on the first page of a special edition of the Daily Planet. We'll be back in a moment to find out what happens. So stand by for the tense climax of today's episode. Working at top speed, Clark Kent and Lois Lane publish an extra edition of the Daily Planet. Early the next morning, Chuck Riggs, the boy who indirectly caused the clan of the Fiery Cross to attack young Tommy Lee, and then, tortured by his conscience, phoned Clark Kent, is at the breakfast table with his mother in the home they share with Chuck's Uncle Matt, secretly the leader of the vicious clan. At his mother's request, Chuck bought a special edition of the Daily Planet from a shouting newsboy. Now, his eyes on his plate, he sits brooding while his mother picks up the paper. Eat your breakfast, Chuck. You'll be in late, late for school. Now, let's see what this extra paper's about. I've had enough, Mom. Enough? Why, you hardly touched your eggs. What's the matter with you these last few days? I'm okay, Mom. Well, you don't act all right. Ever since you got dropped from the Unity House baseball team... Don't talk about that. What? I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't mean to blow up. Don't you speak to me like that again, young man. I said I was sorry. Sorry? You're getting to act more like your Uncle Matt every day. Temper tantrums and brooding spells. I've got to take it from your uncle. This is his house that we live in, but I won't have it from you now. You understand? Yes, ma'am. Um... Well, mind you, don't forget. Now, let's see what's in this paper. I never knew the planet to put out a morning paper before. My land. Listen to this. To the boy who phoned me the night Tommy Lee was captured by the clan of the Fiery Cross... You know by now that another boy, Jim Olson, and the brave man who dared to defy the cowardly clan of the Fiery Cross are in danger of their lives. Mom, please, cut it out. I... I already read that. Well, isn't it awful? That terrible clan. Every one of them ought to be tarred and feathered instead of the decent folks they do it to. And this poor Jim Olson. Say, Chuck, isn't he the one who was the manager of your ball team? Yes, sir. And now his life's in danger. And some boy who could help him won't speak up. Chuck, did you ever hear of anything so terrible? Why, if I had a cowardly boy like that, I'd I'd put him out of my house and never see him again, much as it'd break my heart. You you would, Mom? Of course I would. Think of a boy who won't speak up to save another boy, and a fine man, and who doesn't think enough of his own country to want to protect it from ruffians like the clan of the Fiery Cross. Why, that plan's no better than those Nazis in Germany. But, but, Mom, if that boy did what Mr. Kent wants him to, and the Klan people found it out, they, they'd do something awful to him. Maybe, maybe even tar and feather him. No, no, they wouldn't. Mr. Kent says he and the police would protect him. But the Klan men might be watching Mr. Kent every minute. Nobody knows who they are. Why, why, gosh, your own husband could be a member of the Klan and you wouldn't know it. Or your uncle. My husband wouldn't be a hater in a sheet and hood if he was alive. He'd be out looking for him to wipe him out. That's what your father'd be doing. Yeah, I... Oh, golly, I don't know what to do. You don't know what to do about what? Huh? Oh, oh, nothing, Mom. I was thinking about... About something else. But... Uh, I really don't know what to do. <laughs> Caught between his conscience and his dread fear of the clan of the Fiery Cross, Chuck Riggs hesitates, unable to decide what to do. Whether to go to Clark Kent and reveal the identity of his uncle, or to remain silent. And while Chuck hesitates, Jimmy Olsen and Perry White, far away in the desolate hills, lose hope as no sign of rescue appears. And their ordeal at the hands of the men of hate and bigotry draws nearer. What will happen? Will Chuck Riggs contact Clark Kent, or won't he? Tomorrow tells the story, so don't fail to listen. Tune in, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg, Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Pep, the Sunshine Serial presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, a heavy burden rests on Chuck Riggs. As torn between a sense of honor and a living fear of his uncle, 
he hears his mother champion the appeal that Clark Kent has addressed to him. And now, the adventures of Superman. When a band of robed and hooded hate mongers, known as the Clan of the Fiery Cross, attacked the boy pitcher of the Unity House baseball team because he was Chinese, Editor Perry White offered a reward of $5,000 to anyone who could reveal their identity. That night, the vengeful clan seized White and Jimmy Olsen and took them to a hideout in the hills, where they prepared to tar and feather them. But a storm had swept the barrels of tar into the river, and Matt Riggs, the grand scorpion, returned to Metropolis for more. Meanwhile, Clark Kent had published a front-page letter in the Daily Planet addressed to the unknown boy who had phoned him on the night the hooded bigots had attacked the Chinese youngster. Kent appealed to the boy to reveal the identity of the Klansman, never dreaming that he was Chuck Riggs, the nephew of their leader. As we continue now, Chuck and his mother are at the breakfast table. Chuck is torn between his desire to help Jimmy and his fear of the Klan's vengeance. Listen. If I only knew what to do. If you only knew what to do about what, Chuck? Oh, nothing, Mom. Nothing. Now, don't lie to me, Chuck Riggs. That's the third time you've said that about not knowing what to do. You've got something on your mind. No. Honest, Mom, it's just... Just... Just uh, what? Now, come on now. Out with it. Are you in some kind of trouble? Oh, for gosh sakes, can't you let a fellow alone? Well, not till you tell me what trouble you're in. I'm your mother I'm and not I... in any trouble, I tell you. It's just that... Well, I've been thinking about this boy in the Daily Planet. The one Mr. Kent wrote that letter to. Oh, do you know who he is? I didn't say that. I... Well, I've been thinking... Wondering what I'd do if I was that kid. Oh, is that all that's bothering you, son? Sure, that's all. Look, Mom, suppose you were that kid. What would you do? I'd go to Mr. Kent, of course. I'd tell him all I knew about those ruffians and their sheets and hoods, and I'd see them all in jail. Sure, but suppose they... They have no right picking on people because they go to a different church or because the good Lord saw fit to give them a different color skin. Who were they to question the Lord's way of doing things? I know you're right, Mom, but... But if the boy Mr. Kent mean squealed and the clan found out, they... There's no telling what they do to him. Well, he shouldn't think of that. It's just like Mr. Kent's letter here says. Not only Jim Olsen, but every other boy in the United States is in danger. Unless that clan of the Fiery Cross is broken up. Well, land sakes, Chuck. How do you know that they won't say tomorrow they don't like the church you or I go to? Or the color of our eyes? decide to do something to me or you. Never thought of it that way. You're right, Mom. I'm going to do like you say. You're going to do what? Oh, I... I got to do something right away before maybe it's too late. Well, where are you going, Chuck? Uncle Matt. Oh, well, morning, Matt. I didn't hear you come home. Uh, just sit right down. I'll have your breakfast in a jiffy. Never mind, sir. Never mind. I got to leave again right away. Hey, come on out to the garage with me, will you, Chuck? I'd like to talk to you about something. But I... Uh... I gotta get to school. Won't take long. Come on. What did you want to talk to me about, Uncle Matt? I noticed a copy of the Daily Planet on the breakfast table in there. Did you see Clark Kent's letter on the first page addressed to some boy? Yes, sir. I saw it. That boy isn't you, is it, Chuck? What? You heard me. Did you phone Kent that something happened to Tommy Lee that night? Me? Oh, gosh, what what makes you think it was me? I don't know. I'm just hoping it wasn't you, that's all. Because I'd hate for something bad to happen to my own nephew. What what do you mean? I mean that if that boy was you, Chuck, even though you're my brother's son, I'd see that you were tarred and feathered. You would? Yes, the work of the clan of the Fiery Cross must go on. If anybody tries to stop it... Even if it's my own flesh and blood, blood, it'll go hard on him. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I understand. Good. You see, Chuck, you're the only outsider who ever attended a clan meeting. And since that night, you're being watched. I have? Yes. Somebody is watching you every second. So if you were the boy Kent's looking for and you did try to go with the police, well, you wouldn't have a chance, you see. Yeah. I see. I want you to remember that. Oh, come on, get in the truck. In the truck? Who are for? I'm taking a barrel of... Sli- well, if cement up to a customer and I pass your school on the way. You were going to school, weren't you? Yeah, sure. Of course I was. All right, come on, then. I'll see you get there. 
direct. Terrified and with all thought of going to Clark Kent abandoned, Chuck Riggs climbs into the truck beside his uncle and is driven to school. Some time later, as the sun blazes down on the little clearing in the hills used by the clan of the Fiery Cross as a hideout, Jimmy Olsen and Perry White are in a small cave, outside of which two robed and hooded clansmen stand guard. Across the clearing, a wood fire, tended by other robed and hooded bigots, burns under a huge bucket of tar, which is beginning to bubble and steam. I just about got the wire off my wrist, Mr. White. There, I... Now I'll get it off yours. Uh, I don't know what good it'll do, Jim. We can't get away from these scoundrels. They're too many for us. We can try, can't we? We're just not going to stand still and let them tar and feather us, are we? I still don't believe they'll really go through with it. I do. That grand scorpion, or whatever they call him, is half crazy. <sighs> there. You're free. <sighs> That's a relief. The hands and arms are not as boards. Hey, what's that smell? Hot tar. I guess it... It's almost ready for us. Now, don't talk like that. They wouldn't dare go through with this. They still think they can scare me into a... Uh-oh. Get away from the cave entrance. What's the matter? Get back, I said. He comes there high, monkey buck. Keep your hands behind your back. They're still tied. Okay. I guess this... This is it, Chief. Now, don't go to pieces, Jim. Now, listen. When they take us out of the cave, make a break for those woods across the clearing. We couldn't make it. You said yourself there were too many of these guys. We've got to try. Quiet now, quiet. Here comes Mr. Grand Scorpion and another one. Now remember, as soon as we're out of the cave, make a break. Okay. Well, White, you've had plenty of time to think over my proposition and to smell that hot tar. Have you changed your mind? Well, what do you mean? You know what I mean. Will you agree to stop attacking us in your newspaper, withdraw your reward from information about us, and publish a story saying that the clan of the Fiery Cross was not responsible for the attack on that Chinese boy and his father? Never. All right. We'd see how brave you are when the first brush full of hot tar touches your skin. Ralph, bring him along. Okay. Come on, you. Take your hands off of me. We can walk without your help. Get going, then. Come on, Jim. Remember. Okay. Hey, their hands are untied. Run, Jim, run. Come on. No, you don't. Stop. You let go of me. No, no. Oh, you, you, let me go. Okay, I'm going to get one sock at you. I'm going to tear that foot off your oh. face. <laughs> Never mind, Joe. We got him. There. Now I can see your dirty face. Why, you... What? Cheapers, it's Mr. Riggs. Who? Chuck Riggs' uncle. You made a great mistake when you tore my hood off, Mr. White. Now that you know who I am, well, I can see we got to change our plan. Change our plan? Yes. We can't just tar and feather you and let you go. Well, what do you mean? I mean, Olson, that now and you, Mr. White, must die. Slate-colored, half-mad eyes gleaming like those of a jungle beast. Matt Riggs, Grand Scorpion of the Clan of the Fiery Cross, condemns Jimmy Olsen and Perry White to death. Will his murderous sentence be carried out? We'll know in just a moment, so stand by for the tense climax of today's episode. Just as Matt Riggs was condemning Jimmy Olsen and Perry White to death, Clark Kent returned to the Daily Planet after another vain search for his friends. Beanie Martin, the copy boy, follows him into his office. Where's the plane, Beanie? She went out just a little while ago. Oh? She said she couldn't stand just sitting around and waiting anymore. I know how she feels. Look at Mr. Kent. If we could just get hold of Superman, I'll bet you he could find Jim and Mr. White. Well, he hasn't been able to so far. You mean he's been looking? Sure, and so have the police. Now, if we could only learn the identity of a single member of the clan of the Fiery Cross, I'd make him lead us to the others. Nobody came in to tell us anything about them. And we offered $5,000 reward, too. Yeah, well, whoever might know about the clan is afraid to talk, Beanie. They're afraid they might be caught later and tarred and feathered. Yeah, I was counting on the boy who phoned me that night. I was sure he'd come in after that open letter on the planet this morning. I guess he was afraid of being tarred and feathered, too. I suppose so. Gee, if I only knew who he was. You think he knows who the Klansmen are, huh? I'm sure he does. He knew all about what was going to happen to Tommy Lee that night and where they were taking him. He was very worried about Tommy. Say, wait a minute. Beanie, I think I've got it. Huh? Got what? I think I can find that boy. Keep your fingers crossed, Beanie, and pray hard that I'm not too late. Springing from his chair, Clark Kent rushes from his office. What has he thought of? And will it lead him to Chuck Riggs? Every second counts now because high in the hills, miles from Metropolis, 
Jimmy Olsen and Perry White face death at the hands of the fanatical men of hate, the clan of the Fiery Cross. Monday's episode is packed with excitement, fellows and girls, so don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same tr- station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, with Jim Olsen and Perry White marked for death by the clan of the Fiery Cross, their one chance for rescue rests with Superman and his plan to learn the identity of the hooded mobster. And now, the adventures of Superman. Captured by a band of hooded terrorists known as the Clan of the Fiery Cross, Editor Perry White and Jim Olsen were taken into the hills above Metropolis, where they were to be tarred and feathered in reprisal for the Daily Planet's attacks on the Clan. But when, in an ensuing scuffle, White tore the hood from the Grand Scorpion, their situation became even more serious. Enraged and frightened by the exposure of his identity as Matt Riggs, a well-known trucking contractor, the clan leader announced that White and Olsen must die. Today, while Superman continues his desperate attempt to find them, Jim and Perry White remain bound to trees as, several yards away, Matt Riggs is huddled with his robed and hooded action committee arguing violently in an effort to convince them that their prisoners must not be allowed to remain alive. Listen. I tell you, brothers, these men are dangerous to our cause. Now that they know who I am, they can trace the rest of you through my association with you. Don't you see that? Yeah, sure, Matt, but killing an important guy like the editor of the Daily Planet, that's too risky. Uh, right. Now, wait a minute. Do you want to see the clan of the Fiery Cross busted up? No. Oh, yeah, Do you want to break our sacred vows to save America from all the foreign trash that clutters up our neighborhoods? Well, I think, no, of course not, Matt, but... Uh... But nothing. If we let White and Olson get back alive, we're through. Understand? Finished. Because White has already said about us in our paper is nothing compared to what he'll say now. What's more, he knows who I am, and the police will find out who you are. With all the pressure that he and others like him will put on the police, they'll have to go after us. And no time to break us up. Maybe they'll yeah, shut yeah, up. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. No. I'm telling you, if we let them go, we're a sense for a jail sentence. Every mother's son of us. Then when we get out, we'll find the foreigners running our country and the 100% Americans, our own kind, taking orders from them. No better off than slaves. You want to see that happen? No, no certainly not. I tell you, this is a case of self-preservation, brothers. It's our lives or theirs. Either White or Olsen die or the clan of the Fiery Cross dies. Now take your choice. With eyes blazing with a mad murderous light, Matt Riggs, cunning leader of the robed and hooded bigots, seeks to so inflame the fanatical clansmen with vicious lies that in a passion of hate, they will commit murder. The situation looks grave indeed for Perry White and Jim Olsen as, meanwhile, Superman in his guise of Clark Kent continues his desperate attempts to trace the identities of the Klansmen in an effort to find his friends. Kent's open letter to the boy who called to tell him of the Klan's attack on Tommy Lee having brought no results, he discusses another idea with Beanie Martin, Daily Planet copy boy. My hunch, Beanie, is that the boy I want, the one who I think must know at least one member of the Fiery Cross gang is a player on the Unity House baseball team. Gee, Westminster Kent, how do you figure that? Because all this trouble started right after Jim Olsen put that Chinese boy, Tommy Lee, on the team. At that? Mm-hmm. There was a fight, I recall, and then an attempt was made to scare Tommy into quitting by burning a cross on his lawn. Yeah, I remember that. But jeepers, how could one of the kids get the clan mixed up in that fight? Oh, easy. As you know, those fanatical hooded bigots are against anyone who goes to a different church or whose skin is a different color. Well, all the boy had to do was mention the Unity House incident to a Klansman, maybe his father, his brother, or his uncle, and the Klan went into action. Gee, Wallikins. And then when I persuaded Tommy to stay and pitch an important game... They grabbed Tommy and were going to tar and feather him. That's right, Beanie. Yes, and they'd have gotten away with it, too, if I hadn't been tipped off by that telephone call from some unidentified boy. And that's the kid you wrote the letter to, huh? Yes, yeah. Yes, I thought his sense of fairness and honor would make him come to me, but it didn't work. 
Now, if my hunch that he's a member of the Unity House team is correct, I think I know how I can find him. She was how, Mr. Kent? Well, since the only thing I know about the boy is the sound of his voice, I want to talk with the Unity House ballplayers. Oh, I get it. Hey, that's yours a swell idea. And you can do that right away because I happen to know that the team's practicing today. Oh, good. Say, by the way, who's running them in Jim's absence? Uh, uh, Muggs, I think. Oh, Muggs, eh? Well, I'm sure he'll work with me. All right, I'm going over to the ballpark right now. Jeepers, Mr. Kent, can I go with you, please, can I? Well, all right, Beanie, yes, yes, come along. You may be able to help, too. Oh, boy, swell, let's go. Uh, isn't around, Mr. Kent. They expect him to show up in a little while, though. Oh, gee, well, we can't wait, Beanie. I'm afraid there's no time to lose, and we've got to work fast if I'm to find Mr. White and Jim. Yeah, if the fiery cross clan's got him, there's no telling what'll happen. I'm afraid for the worst. What'll we do? Well, you'll have to work with me. Now, look, here's what I want you to do, Beanie. Yeah? Tell the boys... Well, let's see. Tell them you're on an assignment from the Daily Planet to interview each of them about... Well, about what they think of their chances for winning the championship. Uh-huh. Got that? Yeah. You want me to make like a sports reporter, huh? Right, Beanie, right. Oh, boy. Now, look. You get them to come into the locker room one at a time. Yeah? I'll be listening behind a locker while you ask them a few questions. Uh-huh. Now, if the boy isn't the one that I'm looking for, I'll tap on the metal with a key so you can get rid of him fast and get another one in. Now, do you understand that? Sure, I get it. And when the right kid comes in... I'll let you know. Don't you worry. All right, now get going, Beanie, in a hurry. This is our only chance to find a clue to the Chief and Jim, and it's got to work. What do you think of your chances to win the championship, Freddy? Well, they don't look so good without Jim Olsen and Tommy Lee. Why, the fellas all think... Hey, what's that? Huh? Oh, I don't know. Mice, maybe. Well, thanks, Freddy. Send in another guy on your way out, will you? think you got a chance to win, Tony? Yeah, with a miracle, maybe. But it don't look too good, I'll tell you that much. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Tony. Uh, send the next guy in, will you? Uh, would you mind repeating that, Sam? I said I don't think we got a chance. Yeah, I get you. All uh, right, thanks, Sam. Uh, next guy, please. Well, just give me an idea what you think. I don't even want to think about it. Okay, Johnny. Will you send in the next guy? Uh, thanks, Bobby. Next man. Okay, Joe. Next man. Oh, that's all, Bill. Next man. One by one, the Unity House baseball players file into the locker room, speak briefly to Beanie Martin, and are sent away when Beanie hears the tapping of Clark Kent's key. Finally, the last boy has come and gone. Then, worried by the failure of his plan... Kent walks slowly out to the ball field, followed by Beanie. Oh, bad, Beanie. Very bad. Yeah. Looks as if we drew a blank. You certainly did. And I can't understand it. I was so sure I was on the right track this time. Shapers, how are we going to find Mr. White and Jim now? I don't know. Oh, if only Muggs were here. Maybe he'd be able to give me hey, a Hey, there's Muggs coming onto the field now. Oh, good. Hey, Muggs! Hey, Muggs! Hey! Call him over here, Beanie. Hey, uh, come here a minute, will you? Sure. Hi, Mr. Kent. Hello, Muggs. Say, did you hear anything yet about Jim? No, not what? a thing, Muggs, not a thing. But maybe you can help me out. Sure, sure. What can I do? Just listen for a minute. You see, I've got a hunch that the boy who warned me about what was going to happen to Tommy Lee is a member of this ball team. Are you kidding? No, no, I'm not, Muggs. Now, I don't know his name or even what he looks like. All I know is the sound of his voice. Now, just listen to all the boys who are out there practicing, and none of them fits the bill. Now, can you give me any ideas Hey, to... hey, hey, wait a minute. You still didn't talk to all the players, Mr. Kent. What? Sure we did all, but you and Tommy Lee. Yeah, I know, but there's still one guy who don't play with us anymore. But he was on the team the day we had all the fuss. The same day a cross was burned on Tommy's lawn. Who is that, Muggs? Come with me. I'll show you. <laughs> Hope reborn, Clark Kent and Beanie Martin eagerly follow Muggs, who leads the way across the ball field. Is this the end of Kent's search? We'll know in a moment, so stand by for the tense climax of today's episode. As we continue now, Muggs has led Clark Kent and Beanie Martin across the Unity House ball field to the sidelines at third base, where, his shoulders hunched, the dejected-looking boy stands and watches the team practice. 
the guy I mean, Mr. Kent. He was on his team until a couple of days ago when Jim Olsen fired him for being a sorehead. He was, eh? Hey, that's... Quiet, Pete. I'd like to meet him, Muggs. Sure. Hey, Chuck. Come here. What do you want, Muggs? I uh, want you to meet somebody. Mr. Kent, this is uh, Chuck Riggs. Hello, Chuck. Mr. Kent. Gee whiz, I... I, uh, I gotta go... Wait a minute, be... Chuck. You're just the fellow I've been looking for. Startled and frightened, Chuck Riggs stares at Clark Kent, who places a firmly restraining hand on the boy's shoulder. Can Kent persuade Chuck, who is in mortal fear of the clan's vengeance, to reveal what Superman must know in order to save Perry White and Jim Olsen? Every second is precious now, as the murderous Matt Riggs exhorts his hooded company of fanatical bigots to carry out his death sentence against the gray-haired editor and the young reporter. What will happen? Tomorrow's action-packed episode tells the story, gang. So don't miss a second of it. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P-Pep. Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, a difficult task faces Clark Kent. For though Chuck Riggs is found, fear of his uncle and the dread clan of the Fiery Cross may once more keep him silent. The Adventures of Superman. When editor Perry White launched a vigorous newspaper campaign against the Clan of the Fiery Cross, a group of hate mongers and terrorists whose credo is one religion, one color, the Clan abducted White and Jimmy Olsen and prepared to tar and feather them. But when White tore the hood from the leader's face, revealing him as a man named Matt Riggs, the editor and Jimmy were condemned to death. Meanwhile, Clark Kent was searching for an unknown boy who had phoned him one night with information about the Clan. Kent finally traced the boy to the Unity House baseball team. As we continue now, Kent is alone with the frightened boy, Chuck Riggs, nephew of the Grand Scorpion of the Clan of the Fiery Cross. Listen. You are the boy who phoned me the night Tommy Lee was hurt, aren't you, Chuck? Who, me? What what makes you think... Don't lie now. You phoned me the night the Clan of the Fiery Cross was going to tar and feather Tommy Lee, didn't you? I... I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. You know the clan of the Fiery Cross has got Jim and Mr. White. Now, all I want you to tell me is who some of the clansmen are. Well, how would I know? You knew a lot about them the night you phoned me. You knew where they were taking Tommy, what they were going to do to him. Oh, look, why don't you let me alone? Because a boy's life is in danger and the life of a fine man. And not only they, but every boy and man and woman and girl in the United States is in danger until that clan is stamped out. Look, son, you know what the clan of the Fiery Cross stands for, don't you? I... No, I don't know anything about them. No, you don't. Well, they're cowardly gangsters who operate at night, hidden behind sheets and hoods. Their minds are diseased with hate. They hate the people who go to one church or those whose skin happens to be a different color. No one is safe from them. Do you want to protect people like that, Chuck? Me? No, but All right, then, tell me who they are. Tell me the name of even one of them. I'll guarantee to round up the rest. But I... Oh, jeepers. You're afraid to tell me, aren't you? Afraid? Yes. No. Why should I be afraid? You're afraid the clan will tar and feather you if they find out you told me. Gosh, don't... don't say that. Look, Chuck, suppose I could show you that you'd be safe, that the clan couldn't get you. Would you tell me what I want to know then? You can't show me. They, they're watching me. Maybe right this minute they... I didn't mean to say that. I was... It's all right, son. It's all right. I understand. Look, do you think Superman could protect you from the clan of the Fiery Cross? Superman? Yes. If Superman promised to protect you, you wouldn't be afraid then, would you? Well, no, I guess not, but... Oh, you're just trying to fool me, Mr. Kent. You can't get Superman. Think not? Get ready for a surprise, Chuck. Well, where are you going? To get Superman. You stay right where you are. Walking behind the locker room, Kent swiftly strips off his business suit and stands revealed in the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Up! Up! And away! Rocket 
sailing high above the clouds, the Man of Steel hovers a moment, then plummets to earth to land beside the amazed Chuck Riggs. Creepers, who... Clark Kent said you had something to tell me, Chuck. Superman. Gee whiz. Where'd you come from? I just dropped from up above the clouds. Golly, are you really Superman? I am. Sheepers. Superman. Look, Chuck. You think you can trust me to protect you from the clan of the Fiery Cross? Sure can. Gosh, Superman, am I glad you're here. I almost went crazy worrying about Jim. I was going to go to Mr. Kent this morning when I saw that letter in the Daily Planet. Then it was you who called me, uh, who called Mr. Kent that night. Yeah, sure. I was going to go to Mr. Kent this morning. Honest, I was. But my Uncle Matt stopped me. He, I think he suspected I called Mr. Kent about Tommy Lee. He said the Klan was watching me and warned that if I went near Mr. Kent, I'd get tarred and feathered. Who is your Uncle Matt, Chuck? What's his full name? Matt Riggs. He's a trucking contractor. My mother and I live in his house. Is he a member of the clan? He sure is. He's the big shot, the Grand Scorpion. The Grand Scorpion, eh? Golly, if he knew I was telling you all this... You don't have to worry now, Chuck. I can handle your Uncle Matt and all his robed and hooded gangsters. Tell me, did you hear him say anything about Jim and Mr. White? Uncle Matt was mad as anything at those stories Mr. White put in the Daily Planet about the clan. And the reward he was offering. Yes? I heard him say on the phone to somebody that they had to get Mr. White. Where's your Uncle Matt now, do you know? No, sir, I don't. Well, all right, let's see if we can't find him. Up in my arms with you, Chuck. Are we going to fly? We are. Hang on now. Oh, boy, flying with Superman. I must be dreaming. Here we go. Up, up, and away! (laughs) That your house down there, Chuck? I, I can't be sure from up here. Yeah, that's it. Here's the garage and the apple tree. And my bike under it. Nobody in the garage and just a woman in the house. It must be my mother. Oh, gosh, if she could see me with you. No time for that now. Look, Chuck, are you sure you don't know any other of the clansmen? I just know one of their names is Will, and one is Ralph. You know their last names? Uh-uh. Never saw any of their faces? No. They had on their sheets and the hoods the only two times I saw them. The night they took Tommy Lee away, and at their meeting. At their meeting? You were at a clan meeting? Yeah. When Uncle Matt made me lie about Tommy Lee beating me on purpose... And trying to kill me. Where was this meeting? Way up in the hills someplace. Gosh, it was spooky. A big burning cross. And all those guys in their robes and hoods. All right, never mind that. Where in the hills? Do you remember? Let's see. I know we went out past the bend. The river bend? Yeah. And then we turned off someplace and started to climb into the hills. All right, we'll go out to the bend and try to find where you turned off. Hang on. Away! <laughs> bend down there, Chuck. There's a fork just above it. Is that where you turned off? Wait. Yeah, Superman, that's the place. I remember that broken down old mill. We climbed way up into the hills. Must have been a couple hours we climbed. And then we went off the road and went through the woods to a clearing. All right. We'll follow the road and look for a clearing. Away! A truck couldn't have gone much farther than this in a couple of hours, Chuck. I don't see any other road turning off to a clearing, though. It wasn't exactly a real road, Superman. Oh? No? Just some ruts going through the woods. Oh, well, let's go down lower and look. You find the ruts, Superman? No, not yet. Are you sure? Wait a minute, I see them. You do? Yes, we'll follow them. Let's hope they're the right ones. Oi! There's a the clearing. Yes, it's the one we want, too. Are Jim and Mr. White down? Uh-oh. There? What's the matter? Down to that clearing. Down! This is the place, Chuck? Yeah. This is the place, all right. Look, there's a half-burned wooden cross. But where are Jim and Mr. White? And the Klansmen? They're gone, Chuck. We got here too late. Now, where do we look? <laughs> Helplessly, Superman and Chuck Riggs stare at the deserted clearing, empty save for a half-burned wooden cross. What has happened to Jimmy Olsen and Perry White? We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. As Superman and Chuck Riggs dropped into the deserted hideout of the clan of the Fiery Cross, a truck is rumbling down a narrow hill road many miles away. In the back of the truck, bound hand and foot and gagged, are Perry White and Jimmy Olsen, surrounded by ten robed and hooded figures. At the wheel is Will Jennings, 
Beside him is Matt Briggs, Grand Scorpion of the Hooded Terrorist Band. What's the idea of this extra long trip, Matt? Why didn't we shoot White and Olsen up at the hideout and be done with it? And where'd we bury him? Why, up there in the clearing. Oh, where's your brains, Will? That place isn't safe since my nephew was up there the other night. Your nephew? Oh, you don't think... Yes, I do. I'm kind of worried about him. He acted awful funny this morning about that letter in the Daily Planet. You know, the one that Clark Kent wrote to the kid who called him the night we grabbed that Chinese boy? Yeah, why? Where does Chuck fit in that? I kind of think he was the one who called Kent. What? Hey, watch where you're going, will you? You almost went off the road. Oh, you scared me. Holy smoke, Chuck knows all about... about us here. If you was afraid you'd squeal, how come you didn't do something about him? Because I'm not sure, that's why. But I'll find out for sure when I get home tonight. That's why we didn't do this job up at the hideout. So in case Chuck does squeal, if he brings the cops up there, they won't find anything, you see? Yeah, I see. I gotta hand it to you, Matt. You think of everything. Well, I try to. This is important work we're doing, Will. Hey, look. Look at that glade in the woods over there. That ought to do just fine. Oh, you think it's safe? Sure, it's safe. It's just far enough away from the hideout and off the road. Pull in there. Okay. All right, brothers, drag out those two punks, White and Olsen, and let's get this over with. This is the end of the line for the... Leaping from the truck, the robed and hooded bigots haul the bound and gagged Jim Olsen and Perry White from the truck and drag them off the road to a tiny glade among the trees. Is this the end for our friends? Will the men of hate execute the death sentence before Superman can reach them? No, there still must be a chance that Wright and the Man of Steel will prevail. Tomorrow's episode is packed with thrills and action, fellows and girls. So don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. Now, the adventures of Superman. Certain that Jimmy Olsen and editor Perry White were in the hands of a group of hate mongers and terrorists known as the Clan of the Fiery Cross... Clark Kent tracked down a boy he believed knew the identity of the robed and hooded bigots. The boy was Chuck Riggs, nephew of Matt Riggs, the Grand Scorpion of the clan. And when Kent appeared before him as Superman and promised him protection, Chuck revealed the identity of his uncle. Unable to find Matt Riggs in Metropolis, Superman, guided by Chuck, streaked to a clearing in the hills, used by the clan as a meeting place, but arrived after Jimmy and White had been taken several miles away to be executed. As we continue now, Superman, every sense alert, stares about the dark, deserted clearing. Chuck speaks to him anxiously. What do we do now, Superman? Got to pick up the clan's trail, Chuck. They were here recently, and I'm sure they had Jim and Mr. White with them. How do you know? See that big bucket over there? Mm -hmm. Well, what about it? Full of tar. Tar? There was a fire under it a short time ago. Also, that bag lying by the half-burned cross has feathers in it. Cheapers. You think they... They tarred and feathered Jim and Mr. White? I'm not sure. I know that's what those cowards usually do to anyone who defies them. If they can catch him in the dark when he hasn't a chance. But they didn't turn the chief and Jim loose around here. How do you know they did? I would have spotted them from up above. That means they took them somewhere else. Now, let's see. These big tire tracks were made by a truck. Oh, two trucks. Yeah, my uncle's trucks. That's how the clan travels. Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter, Superman? Both trucks took this rutted trail that goes through the woods and out to the main road. Come on, up with you, Chuck. Fast. Are we going to follow the tracks? We're going to try to. All right, hang on now. Up and away! Uh Uh-oh. Now what? What are you stopping for, Superman? See that fork down there? Uh, Yeah. See how three roads go off through the hills in three different directions? We'll all have tire tracks on them. Which one do those hooded rats take? Gee, I don't know. I guess there's only one thing to do. Wrap my cape around you, son. That's it. All right, hang on tight, Chuck. We're going to range around. Away! Flashing in great arcs through the sky above the hills, Superman's keen eyes search desperately for a sight of the clan trucks bearing his friends. Meanwhile... In a tiny, rough, stubbled glade surrounded by towering trees, Jimmy Olsen and Perry White, bound hand and foot, lie helplessly on the ground. A few feet away, four robed and hooded men are digging a deep trench by the light of a small lamp. A dozen other clansmen stand nearby with Matt Riggs, their grand scorpion. As soon as they 
finished digging the, the grave, Mr. White. We... No, no, we... no, no. Take it easy, Jim. How can I? When I think what's going to happen to Nothing's us... Nothing's happened yet, so think about something else. What? What'll I think about? Oh, how do I know? Anything, anything. Okay, I... I'll think about baseball. You know, my team, Unity House, is playing for the boys' championship of Metropolis Saturday. Mm -hmm. Only I won't be there to manage them. And Tommy Lee won't be able to pitch because the Klan broke his arm. The Klan messed up everything. I told you to think about something else. I can't. Look what they did to Tommy Lee and his father and to Polko. Look what they're doing to us. Gee whiz, Mr. White. Why does a swell country like the United States have to have outfits like the Clan of the Fiery Cross? Every country has its lame brains and diseased minds, Jim. Germany had the Nazis. We've got the Clan of the Fiery Cross. No, oh, I just hope our country realizes the danger of these these lunatics in nightshirts before it's too late. Well, still making one of your big speeches, eh, White? Well, save your breath. You've only got a short time left. Well, You're a big... madman, Riggs. You'll go to the chair for this. Don't make me laugh. I warned you, you couldn't stop the work of the Klan. Nobody can. That's what you think. I said nobody can stop us. We're going to get rid of every foreigner in this country. Everyone who thinks, acts, and looks different from us. Anybody who tries to stop us will get the same thing you're getting. Okay, boys. No, oh, the man's mad. Absolutely mad. And we're through, Chief. This is it. Harry! Yeah, Matt? As Grand Defender of the Klan of the Fiery Cross, you will now perform your sacred duty. Here's a gun. Take care of those two chink lovers. Okay. Here it comes, Mr. White. Easy, Jim, easy. All right, you dirty punks. Here's where you get yours. You mean here's where you get yours? What the... I'll take that gun, and you take this. Superman, Chief, it's Superman. Thank heaven. Hello, Jim. I'll just get these ropes off you and Mr. Oh, White. thank heaven you've arrived just in time. And how? And then... Hey, look, the Klansmen are getting away. Go after them, Yes, Superman. yes, these ropes can wait. Don't let them get away. Don't you worry, they won't get far. There, you're free. All right, now get behind those trees in case there's any more shooting. I'll round up our friends in the sheets. Away! Like a great flashing eagle, the man of steel pounces upon the terrified clansmen as they seek wildly to escape through the woods. Swiftly, he rounds them up, herds them into their truck, and ropes them securely together. All right, Jim, Mr. White, climb into the front seat. We'll hop over the trees to that next hill and pick up Chuck where I left him. Then we deliver this load of soiled sheets to Inspector Henderson's laundry. Oh, boy. Come on, Chief. No, I just want to pay my respects to Mr. High Mucky Muck. He said nobody could get in the Klan's way and live. No time now, Mr. White. I understand this gang is just the action committee. We've got to get back to Metropolis and round up the rest of them. All right, hurry. Get into the truck. All right. Come on, Jim. All set? All set, Superman. Up with it, then. There we are. Up and away! <laughs> Lifting the huge truck as if it were a child's toy, Superman carries it swiftly over the trees to where Chuck Riggs waits for him, then streaks on to Metropolis and lands in the parking area behind police headquarters. All out. End of the line. Boy, oh boy. Will Inspector Henderson be glad to see these guys? Oh, I wish I had a cameraman here. Well, you Klansmen are a fine, brave-looking bunch now, eh? Uh, but you'll look better when you swap those sheets for striped prison uniforms. Oh, not for me, for now listen to them squeal. Rats always squeal when they're cornered, Jim. They're only brave when their victims are smaller and weaker than themselves. Come on, all of you. Out of the truck. Oh, boy, this is wonderful. How do you feel now about stopping the clan, Riggs? Hey, Riggs. Riggs. Uh, say, where is he? Oh. Well, the Grand Scorpion, or wherever he calls himself. Matt Riggs. Where is he? Gee whiz, I don't see him. They must be here. Well, he isn't, I tell you. His robe had a blue scorpion on it. That's right. He must have got away. Oh, I'm sure I got everyone on the road and in the woods. Wait a minute. All of you, take off your hoods. Take them off, I say. That's better. Now, Mr. White, Jim, Chuck, is Matt Riggs here? No, no, he no, got no. away. Oh, great Scott, I don't see how We've he could We've got to find him, Superman. He's the big noise of this outfit, and he's a dangerous madman, a murderer. He sure is. Oh, golly, now he'll get me. He'll come back don't and Don't you worry, Chuck. You stay here until I get back, all of you. Oh, good, here come some officers. Tell them what happened, Mr. White, and see that these clansmen are locked up. I'm going back to find Riggs. Up and away! Once more taking to the skyways, the Man of Steel rockets back to the glade in the hills. Confidently at first, then increasingly worried, he searches over the glade and through the surrounding woods. 
widening his search over the more distant hills and roads and rivers. But the hours go by, and still he is unable to find Matt Riggs. What has happened to the cunning half-mad leader of the clan of the Fiery Cross? We'll find out in just a moment. So stand by for the exciting climax of today's episode. Late that night, a superman and the alerted police scour the hills and countryside for Matt Riggs. The grand scorpion of the clan of the Fiery Cross stops at the door of a handsome brick house in a town across the state line and rings the bell. His clothes are bedraggled. His shoes are caked with mud. But his strange slate-colored eyes still gleam with a half-mad light as the door opens and Cedric Wilson, grand imperial mogul of the clan of the Fiery Cross, peers into the dark. Who? Matt Riggs. What are you doing here? Let me in, Wilson. The clan's in danger. Danger? Yes, but I know what to do. I know how to save it, Wilson. Really? Yes, but we got to work fast, very fast. Look, ain't Come you... in, Riggs. Follow me. Quickly, the Grand Scorpion and the Grand Imperial Mogul, supreme national leader of the clan of the Fiery Cross, disappear into a darkened hallway inside the handsome house. What is Matt Riggs' plan? What new menace are the leaders of the men of hate about to hatch against our friends and against all decent citizens? Our story has taken a strange new twist, fellows and girls, which makes tomorrow's episode packed with thrills, drama, and surprise. So don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P-Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, our story takes a new twist. As Matt Riggs, fanatical leader of the clan of the Fiery Cross, eludes capture and carries new plans for attack to the grand imperial mogul of the terrorists. And now, the adventures of Superman. Although Superman captured the action committee of the Clan of the Fiery Cross just as they were about to execute Jimmy Olsen and editor Perry White, Matt Riggs, grand scorpion of the terroristic band, managed to escape. For many hours, Superman searched the hills for the cunning fanatical leader, but was unable to find him. Late that night, his clothes bedraggled and his shoes caked with mud, Riggs arrived at a handsome house in a neighboring state. This is the home of Cedric Wilson, grand imperial mogul of the Clan of the Fiery Cross. And as we continue now... In Wilson's library, the white-haired, thin-lipped supreme ruler of the hate mongers faces Matt Riggs, whose slate-colored eyes glow with a strange, burning fire. Listen. You shouldn't have come here, Riggs. I had to, Wilson. The clan's in danger. We'll be in much worse danger if you were followed. Uh, Don't worry, I wasn't followed. Now listen, Wilson. You can't be sure. There's probably a five-state alarm out for you by now. You're a stupid fool, Riggs. Me? Stupid? Why? Yes. No one but a stupid fool would risk the murder of an important man like the editor of the Daily Planet. But I had to, Wilson. He found out who I was. I'd have got away with it, except for Superman. Now, in addition to the police, you've got Superman looking for us. Uh, Do you realize what that means? Just when we were launching a huge new membership drive? This will cost us 10,000 new members. Maybe not, Wilson. Maybe Maybe nothing. Your fool stunt cost us 10,000 new members who would have paid us $100 apiece for initiation fees and another $25 for robes and hoods. That means over one million dollars would have split. So what? What's money got to do with the spot we're in now? What's money got to do with it? Yes, after all, we're not in this only for money. No? What have you been doing with the 25% cut you get on all new members to the Metropolis chapter? And the 10% cut on their robes? Giving it to charity? Certainly not. I like money, sure. But aside from that, I'm, I'm, I'm also working to purify America, to clean it up foreigners. Oh, come now, Riggs. Look, Wilson, I know we're in a bad spot. But if you'll only call in the National Action Committee... Wait a but... minute. Is it possible that you really believe all that stuff about getting rid of the foreigners? That one race, one religion, one color hokum? Hokum? Why, it's the absolute truth. We've got to save America from foreign elements. Well, I'll be... I thought you had brains, Riggs. But obviously something's happened to you. 
You become drunk on a slop we put up for the suckers. Suckers? Who are you calling? Our members, Riggs. The poor fish who want to hate and blame somebody else for their failures in life. The saps who believe drivel such as a man is a dangerous enemy because he goes to a different church. The little nobodies who want to believe some of the race is inferior so they can feel superior. The jerks who go for that 100% American rot. Rot? You mean you don't believe? Of course not. You must know there is no such thing as what we call 100% American. Everyone here except the Indians is descended from foreigners. Boy, bless you, Wilson. You talk like a dirty foreigner yourself. I'm running a business, Riggs, and so are you. We deal in one of the oldest and most profitable commodities on earth. Hate. Your mistake was when you forgot you were a businessman and began believing your own sales talk. I didn't make any mistakes. I only had tough luck. Wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. You said you wanted me to summon our National Action Committee, didn't you? Yes. For what reason? To get rid of Perry White and Jim Olson and my nephew Chuck. They got me into this trouble and they can identify me. And they dare to defy the clan of the Fiery Cross. I thought so. You've lost your mind, Riggs. You've turned into a bloodthirsty fanatic. You're a great danger to the life of the clan now, and you've got to be stopped. Why, what do you mean? I'll show you what I mean. It's you or the clan, Matt. Put down that gun. Not until... Ah! Stop it. Stop it, you're breaking my arm. That gun. All right. No, you traitor. Let me go. I'm going to choke it. Finish you off, Matt. No. Do that. You're a traitor to the clan. And you know what that means? So now I'm going to finish you. Then I'll go back to Metropolis and get White Nolson and my sniveling nephew. No one can stop me in the clan of the Fiery Cross. When is the next plane to Metropolis? Flight 12 leaves in 10 minutes. Arrives in Metropolis at 4 a.m. All right, I want one ticket. What name, sir? Huh? Uh, Rigney. Uh, yes, M- Martin Rigney. Just a minute. What? Matt Rigney? Not so loud. Come on, get dressed, Fred, and come with me. Where? Never mind where. This is a clan order. But, but, Matt, all the cops are looking for you. It's in the papers and on the radio. So what? We got a job to do. What job? We've got to get rid of Perry White and Jim Olson and my nephew. Then there'll be nobody left to testify against me, and the clan can go on. Now, come on. Hurry up and get dressed. Uh-uh, not me. I've had enough of the clan. I don't want to go to the electric chair. Good night. Now, wait a minute. Boy, the dirty yellow rat. <laughs> Get ready to come with me, George. Nothing doing, Matt. I'm all through with the clan. As soon as the wife and I finish packing, we're getting out of town. Out of town? What's the idea? The action committee was rounded up by Superman, and they've squealed. It was just on the radio. They told the cops the names of all the clan members they knew. I'm getting out before the cops come for me. Matt Riggs. Holy smoke, I thought it was the police coming for me. Get out of here. Now, wait a minute, Tom. Get away from here, I said. I don't want to hear any more of your smooth talk. I'm game for scaring foreigners by flogging and tar and feathering. But murder? Not for me. Go on, get away from my house. Who's there? Me, Matt Riggs. Open up, Bill. Easy. Now, wait a minute, Easy, Bill. Easy, I said it. I'll call the cops. <laughs> Listen, Joe, there's a big job to do for the clan. Uh, all right, you dirty cowards. I'll get White Nolson and Chuck alone. I'll save the clan of the Fiery Cross myself. Then let me see you come crawling back. Standing on the deserted street as dawn is beginning to break, Matt Riggs, out of his mind with hate, shakes his fists violently over his head, vowing to take the lives of Editor White, Jimmy Olson, and young Chuck Riggs. <laughs> We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Neither Clark Kent nor Inspector Henderson have slept during the night. Now, as dawn begins to break, both men are in Henderson's office at Metropolis Police Headquarters. His face haggard, the inspector wearily answers the phone, then stiffens alertly. Yes, I heard you, Hilly. Are you sure it was him? He did, huh? 
Well, did you check it? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Stick with it and keep me posted. Right. What's up, Inspector? Get this, Kent. What? A man answering the description of Matt Riggs, using the name Rigney, boarded a state airline's plane in Graham City at 1.30 this morning. Uh-oh. Where was the plane bound? From Metropolis. It landed a couple of hours ago. Oh, was Riggs picked up? No. What? My men were watching the terminal and the outgoing planes. We didn't expect him to fly into Metropolis. I was sure Riggs was hiding out in the hills. Well, he made his way out through an old lead mine. That's why I missed him. You missed him? Huh? Oh, I, I mean Superman. Uh, lead, you know, is the one substance his X-ray vision can't penetrate. Uh, look, Inspector, Matt Riggs is dangerous. He's got to be found. We'll find him eventually. Eventually? You've got to find him now at once. Take it easy, Kent. The clan of the Fiery Cross is practically broken up in this oh, town. They're scared, and so is Riggs. They won't try anything. Most of the clansmen are scared, yes. They're just sheep who followed where Riggs led them. But Riggs isn't scared. He's, he's a, a fanatic, a dangerous maniac. He, he, he might even make another attempt on the lives of Mr. White and Jim. Oh, Arthur. nonsense. I've seen other leaders of these screwball hate crowds. Well, now, wait they a minute. sound crazy when they're up on the soapbox, but it's all an act to enlist members and rake in initiation fees. Oh, no, you're They're wrong. too smart to risk their skins when they know they're on the police list. I tell you, you're wrong, Inspector. Jim and Mr. White both say Matt Riggs is mad. Relax, Kent. We're watching Riggs' house, but Jim and White aren't in any danger. I tell you, they are. And I can't be out in the suburbs watching Mr. White and here in town watching Jim and Chuck at the same time. Now, you've got to send a police detail all out there. All right, to... all right. If it'll make you happy, I'll send some men out to keep an eye on them. Thanks, Inspector. I just hope they're not too late. Arguing desperately, Clark Kent persuades Inspector Henderson to send special police details to the homes of Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, and Chuck Riggs. But a sixth sense must be warning Kent that they may be too late. For at this moment, while dawn is still only a hazy mist on the shroud of night, Matt Riggs stands in the dark basement of his house having entered by a secret tunnel from his garage. For a long moment, the fanatical leader of the clan of the Fiery Cross stands motionless, listening as the footsteps of the police officer outside the house fade away. Then, his strange slate-colored eyes shining like an animal's in the dark, he starts up the steps to the kitchen and on up to his nephew's room at the head of the stairs. What will happen? Tomorrow brings an episode in which many exciting things happen, so be sure not to miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, with Matt Riggs still at large in Metropolis, the lives of Jimmy Olsen, Perry White, and Chuck Riggs are, as Superman fears, gravely imperiled. Now, the adventures of Superman. When Superman rescued editor Perry White and Jimmy Olsen from a group of hate mongers and terrorists, Matt Riggs, their fanatical leader, managed to escape. Fearing the testimony of White and Jimmy, Riggs decided to do away with them and with his young nephew Chuck, who had revealed his uncle's identity to Superman. While the police searched for him, Riggs used a secret tunnel to enter his home, where he lived with his sister-in-law and her son Chuck. As we continue now, he has noiselessly climbed the stairs to Chuck's room. The first streaks of dawn faintly light the shadowy hall as the hate-crazed Riggs, his slate-colored eyes blazing with venom, softly opens his nephew's door and approaches the bed. Listen. No, you double-crossing little rat. I'm going to... What? He's not here. Who's there? Who's there, I said? Not so loud, sir. It's me, Matt. Mercy me. Matt Riggs, how'd you get in? Never mind, Matt. Where's Chuck? The police are looking for you. They're outside the house. I'm going to... Oh, no, you don't. Let go my wrist. You're hurting me. Uh, You were going to call the cops, weren't you? Going to give away your own brother-in-law. Let me go. Where's Chuck? He's at... Uh, oh, I, I don't know where he You're is. You're lying. No, I, I don't. You started to say where he is. Now go on, say it. I, I, I didn't say anything. Did. I tell you, I don't You're know where You're lying. Uh, tell me where he is or I'll... Stop. 
Please, you're hurting me. You tell me where that sneaking little whelp is. Why, why do you want him? He revealed my identity to Clark Kent. Well, he did right. Your, your gang's wicked, like them Nazis. I'd have told on you, too, if I'd have known. Ow! You're oh, going to tell arm. me where he is? No. I don't care what you do to me, I won't. Wait. I'll bet he's at Jim Olsen's house, isn't he? No, no, he's not there. Oh, you gave it away, Sarah. No, no, I tell you, he's not there. He's, oh, he's quiet. not... quiet. No, I can get both those young rats at the same time. Then there'll only be white left. Oh, no, you don't. Let me go, you... you oh, no, no. I got a big job to do. Nobody's going to stop me. I'll tie up with this sheet. And then I'll lock in the closet. And I'll take care of your whelp son and Olsen. <laughs> Let's see now. Must be that house in the corner. All right, slow down, Lou. Okay. No, no, stop. Don't stop. Keep going. But you said... Keep going, I said. I don't get it. Didn't you see that car that just turned into the driveway of Olsen's house? No. No, well, look now. We're passing it, but don't slow up. Graves, a police car. Darn good thing I saw it in time. What do you suppose the cops want here? I don't know. Sarah couldn't have called him because I tied her up then locked her in the closet. All right, turn the corner and stop under that big tree, Lou, right there by that vacant lot. Maybe we ought to keep going. Do as I say, will you? Okay, okay, you're the boss. All right, kill the motor. All right. Now, let's see. Blast it, those cops are patrolling right in front of Wilson's house. Oh, we better scram that before they spot us. No, 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 they won't spot us up here. This tree hides us. We're taking a big risk, what Matt. A dirty break, Olsen and Chuck both right in that house, and I can't get at them. Yeah, and chances are the cops are guarding Perry White's house, too. Sure, they must be. So there's nothing we can do, so we might as well go, huh? Can you turn that motor off? But, Matt, turn it off, I said. Okay... But I don't see the percentage in sitting here right under the noses of them cops. No, you don't. Even if Olsen and Chuck walked out of the house right now, you wouldn't take a chance of shooting at them. I wouldn't, wouldn't I? Well, just let me see them walk out of that house. I'll drop them in their tracks with this rifle. With all them cops around? You're crazy, Matt. But I'm not. I'm getting out of oh, here. Oh, no, you're not. I sure am. I ain't sticking here with no trigger-happy madman. A fine brother you are. Why, you're as yellow as all the other rats who ran out on me. But you're not going to run out until this job is over. Not until Chuck and White and Olsen are dead. And I and our group are safe again. Now, you sit here and be quiet. Now, look, man. Shut up! Did you get that newspaper from me like I had told you to? Yeah. Here it is. Let me see it. I want to see what they say about us. You keep your eyes peeled on Olsen's house. If that kid comes out, you yell quick. Okay. Now, then. Oh, look at that. What? A picture of my action committee right here on the first page. Holy smokes. Listen to this. Matt Riggs' action committee pleads for mercy. Blames Riggs for attacks on Lee family and Perry White and James Olson. Say they were duped by false promises into wrongdoing. Why, that dirty yellow rat. You can't blame him for being scared, Matt, with Superman after him and the cops. Well, that's bad odds. Will you shut up? Listen to this. Will Jennings admits joining attack on Dr. Lee and his young son, Tommy, because Matt Riggs had promised to secure a $5,000 a year position for him in the health department, a position now being held by Dr. Lee, the well-known Chinese bacteriologist. When questioned by Superman, Jennings admitted that he lacked proper qualifications for the position, but hoped nevertheless... Oh, boy, would I get my hands on that Jennings. The dirty squealer. I didn't think he'd rat on you. Yeah, but don't you worry... He'll come crawling back when I'm on top again, and I will be. All I have to do now is to get rid of White and Olsen and Chuck so they can't testify against me. Then... But how are you going to do that if the cops is going to be watching them all the time? Oh, shut up. I'll find a way. Hey, wait, what's this? What? Look, it says the boys' baseball championship of Metropolis will be decided this afternoon at the stadium. When Unity House plays against Metropolis High School. So what's that to get excited about? you let me finish and shut up? It says Jim Olson, manager of the Unity House team, announced that Chuck Riggs will pitch. And Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet, sponsors of the championship tournament, will be on hand to present the winning team with solid gold baseballs. Uh Uh-oh. Now do you get it, Lou? Well, maybe. You mean... I mean the three persons I've got to get rid of. 
Perry White, Jim Olsen, and my nephew Chuck will all be at the stadium baseball field this afternoon, and we're going to be there, too. Come on, Lou. Get this car rolling. We've got things to do. We'll return in a moment for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. Crowds are pouring into the Metropolis Stadium for the game between Jim Olsen's Unity House team and Metropolis High School, finalists in the baseball tournament for the Boys' Championship of Metropolis. On the field, both teams are engaged in practice. At one end of the field, Clark Kent stands in anxious conversation with Police Inspector Henderson. I don't care what you say. I'm worried, Inspector. I still think this game should have been called off until Matt Riggs is caught. Oh, relax, Kent. There isn't nearly as much danger as you think. Relax? Mm. Are you kidding? You know Matt Riggs swore he'd kill Mr. White, Jim Olson, and Chuck. Ah, uh, threats are a dime a dozen, you know that. Well, that may be, but this man is a fanatic, Inspector. Hate and disappointment have made him a, a maniac. He won't stop short of murder, but if he can get away with it. Well, he can get away with it. Anyhow, not here in the stadium. Why? First, because he can't get in. And second, because I've got top-notch men posted all over the field and in the stands. Well... If Riggs somehow manages to show up, he'll be a dead pigeon before he can move a muscle. I don't know. I wish I could feel as confident as you do. But Riggs is shrewd and shifty. Take my word for it, Kent. He'll have to be a hundred times smarter than he is to get into the stadium. So relax and enjoy the game. You leave Matt Riggs to me. Oh, sorry, I won't relax, Inspector. I can't. Not for a moment. Because I... Well, because I smell danger. Once more, Clark Kent's super senses warn him of danger. But can even he cope with the triple death trap even now being set by Matt Riggs? For at this moment, on a high roof overlooking the stadium, Matt Riggs and his henchman Lou lie flat on their stomachs, shielded from all view by an overhanging skylight which fans out above them. Held firmly in Riggs' hands and pointed at the field below is a powerful long-range rifle equipped with telescopic sights. Now he watches through field glasses. They're getting ready to start the game, Lou. In a moment, Chuck will walk out there in the pitcher's mound. I'll have a good, clear shot at him. But how about Olsen and White? you got to get them all pretty close together. Yeah, look. White's walking into the box now. Olsen's sitting down there at the end of the bench. <laughs> I can get an easy, clear beat on all three of them. You sure you can hit them from way up here? Hit them from up here? Why, I can knock over a running deer at a thousand yards. <laughs> and this will be like shooting sitting ducks. Watch. Lifting his long rifle to his shoulder, Matt Riggs squints through the powerful telescopic sights, bringing Jimmy Olsen squarely into view as the young reporter sits tensely at the end of the Unity House bench. What will happen? How can Superman avert this final threat to his friends in the scant seconds remaining? There's plenty of excitement ahead in the smashing climax of this story. So don't fail to be with us Monday when amazing things take place. Tune in, same time, same station. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look! Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! Kellogg Pep! P-E-P, Pep! Kellogg Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman! Today, following vengeance on Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, and his young nephew Chuck, Matt Riggs attempts to make the Unity House baseball field an arena of death. And now, the adventures of Superman. Due to the efforts of Superman, a group of hate mongers and terrorists has been broken up, and most of its cowardly leaders are in jail. But Matt Riggs, the vicious head of the band, is still at large. Wild with rage at his nephew Chuck, who had revealed his identity to Superman, Riggs determined to do away with the boy, and with editor Perry White and Jimmy Olsen, whose testimony can send him to jail for life. Discovering that all three objects of his hate would be at a baseball game for the boys' championship of Metropolis gave the half-mad fanatic his opportunity. Everything looked just right, with Jimmy Olsen managing the Unity House team, Chuck Riggs pitching, 
and Perry White watching the game from a box. Now, while police keep sharp watch over the crowded stadium, Matt Briggs flies a block away on a high roof overlooking the playing field. A long-range rifle equipped with telescopic sights in his hands. He's accompanied by a seedy, ferret-faced man named Lou. Listen. Oh, sitting at the end of the bench. I'll get him first. That... Oh, blast it. What's the matter, man? Uh, some big guy walked over there and stood right in front of Olsen. He's still standing there. Then get your big mouth nephew, Chuck. He's all alone on the pitcher's mound. Look, I've got to get Chuck and Olsen and Perry White just sap. Sure, I know, but... Yeah, and they all have to be in the clear at the same time before I shoot. Why do they? Why? Because there'll be a flash in the gun that'll give us away when I fire. I gotta pick them off one, two, three, just like that. So we can get away before the cops get here. Oh. Wait. Wait. The big guy is walking away. Now... Doggone it. Now what? Oh, don't you see the players gathering around Chuck on the mound? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was watching Olsen. What happened? Uh, that other team got a couple of hits, I guess, and the Unity players are talking it over with Chuck. Yeah. Sure, there goes Olsen out to join the party. Yes, I wish you'd get this over with, Matt. I got the jump. Well, it won't be long now. I'll get those three rats, and then we can be going. You sure you can hit them from way up here, huh? Am I sure? Didn't I tell you I can knock down a running bear at a thousand yards? Well, this job is a cinch. I'll get White, then Olsen, and then that double-crossing nephew of mine, just like I said I would. Wait and see. That's Matt Riggs lies waiting on the nearby roof. Jimmy Olsen, unaware of his peril, fidgets nervously on the Unity House bench as he speaks to Clark Kent. I'm worried, Kent. Yeah, so am I, Jim. It was only the first inning, and Metropolis High got two runs already. Oh, that. What do you mean, oh, that? Chuck is nervous as a, a wet hen. Oh, boy, if only we had Tommy Lee pitching for us today. Uh-huh. Can't see him anywhere. You can't see who? Matt Riggs. What? Matt Riggs? Mm-hmm. But, gee whiz, you, you think he's here? I don't know, Jim. Inspector Henderson is certain he couldn't get into the stadium without being spotted, but... I'm worried. My head, my head, we got a head. Come on now, Frankie, drive him home. Aren't you excited, Mr. King? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure I am, Jim, but I'd be a lot happier if I knew where Matt Riggs is. That's headed up here much longer, Matt. I'm getting the jitters. Come on, get it over with and let's blow, will you? Oh, take it easy, will you, Lou? Take it easy, nothing. Supposing somebody sees us up here and calls the cops. There's cops all over the stadium. Will you cut it out? Nobody can see us up here in this roof. I ain't so sure. Look, you had a dozen chances to shoot. What are you waiting for? I told you, didn't I? I'm not shooting until I can get White and Olsen and Chuck all in the clear. So I can get them with just three quick shots. But all three of them are never in the clear at the same they time. They will be, though. And just as soon as they are, I'll let them have it. Tied the score, and Chuck Riggs seems to be settling down. It's better for Unity House now, Kent. That's right, Chief. If only... If only what? Oh, nothing. Why do you keep walking around? Sit down here. Oh, thanks. I'd rather stand. If anything happens, I'll be ready. Ready? Ready for what? I wish I knew. Frankly, I'm worried about Matt Riggs, Chief. Well, uh, that rotten apple is far away from here by now. I don't know. He knows the police and the FBI are looking for him. Now sit down, Kent, and forget about Matt Riggs. I can't forget him. Got a powerful hunch he's nearby. Oh, not. Inspector Henderson's men are at every entrance and scattered through the sand. If Riggs is stupid enough to try and get in here, they'd grab him. Yeah, I suppose so, but... Wait, what's that? Oh, boy, just struck out, if that's what you mean. No, there was a strange flash of light up that way. A flash of light? Yeah, like the sun reflecting... Oh, there it is again. Oh, I don't see anything. Oh, it's gone now, but... Great Scott! What? What is it, Ken? On that roof. I'll see you later, Chief. glasses has gone from front of White's box. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Chuck and Olsen still standing by the bench. Yeah, let's see. They're walking away from each other, but they're all alone. Clear shot. Yeah, okay. All right. Here's where those three rats get theirs. First, Mr. Perry White. His mad, slate-colored eyes blazing, Matt Riggs takes careful aim at Perry White. Then slowly his finger curls around the trigger of his rifle. We'll be back in a moment for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. As 
Matt Briggs, lying on a high roof overlooking the Metropolis Stadium, took careful aim at Perry White, who was sitting in a box on the field. Clark Kent was behind the stand, stripping off his business suit to stand revealed in the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Matt Briggs on that roof with a rifle. He's aiming at Perry White. He's firing. He's got to stop that bullet. Away! Like a flashing comet, Superman streaks above the grandstand, then swoops down to snatch the whistling bullet just before it reaches the unsuspecting Perry White. Got it. Firing again. A Jimmy this time. Away! Coiling in midair, the man of steel straightens out and rockets across the diamond, seizing another leaden pellet from the air before it strikes Jimmy Olsen. Then... Go out. Now for the third. Away! Swerving, Superman flashes to the pitcher's mound with the speed of light, plucks a deadly bullet from the air as it is about to strike Chuck. Then, without pausing, he soars up from the stadium to the roof, where Matt Riggs, the look of fury on his face, is about to fire his rifle again. Oh, no, you won't, Riggs. Huh? What are Riggs you doing? Riggs strikes her out. I'll take that rifle. What the hoop? Matt, look! Superman! Right. Give me that gun, I said. No, say. no, I won't. Struggling won't help you, Matt. You let me go. Let me go. I'm going to kill you. You're all through killing, my friend, and you're all through with all your other dirty work. Come on, now. Under my arm with you. You too, mister. No, let me go. I didn't do nothing. Tell that to the judge. All set for the city jail? Here we go. Up and away! Leaping from the roof with Matt Riggs and his henchmen under his arm, Superman streaks with them to police headquarters. A short time later, once more in his guise of the mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent, he is back in the stadium to stand beside Perry White as the gray-haired editor distributes small gold baseballs emblematic of the boys' baseball championship of Metropolis to the victorious Unity House players. You boys of Unity House have done a fine job, and I am proud of you. You've not only proved that you're the best baseball team, but you've proved that youngsters of different races and creeds can work and play together successfully in the American way. Well said, Chief. Yes, sir. Well, boys, now it's up to uh, us Excuse to... me for interrupting, Mr. White, but Chuck here wants me to tell you something. Oh, come on, Chuck. Speak for yourself. No, wait, Mr. Kent. Huh? Well, he's afraid it'll sound like he's grandstanding if he says it himself. I can see what he means, so I said I'd talk for him. Oh, I see. Well, what is it, Jim? Well, Chuck feels like he doesn't deserve this gold baseball. What? Well, what kind of nonsense is that? Of course he does. Certainly, he pitched a fine game. Sure, that's what I told him. But he says Tommy Lee would have pitched the game if Chuck's uncle and his dirty gang hadn't broken his pitching off. Besides, Tommy coached him through the game. So... Well, he wants you to give his gold baseball to Tommy. Well, I say that's very decent of you, Chuck, but now I... Let me talk, Kent. It is decent of you, Chuck, but it won't be necessary. Because, you see, I've had another gold baseball made for Tommy. Oh. Now, I'd like all of you boys to come with me to deliver it to him. Now, what oh, do you say? Oh, huh? that's oh, swell, Chief. Certainly yeah. is. Oh, boy. Smiling in the taxi cab, Perry White, Clark, Kent, Jimmy Olsen, and the happy Unity House players drive to Tommy Lee's house. And so, another Superman adventure has come to a close. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is the copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal.